Man, I'm just waiting for y'all to catch up. That's what I see as I look through this game. I see a lot of people that not only listen to Pimp C, but they listened to Pimp C. If you talk to his contemporaries, you talk to niggas like Tip and all of them, they'll tell you, man. Like, man, Pimp was serious. He was serious about the South. He was dead serious. And that's why niggas like the T.I.s and the Killer Mikes and these new generations, that's why they so serious about how their business is handled, how their videos are shot, how their clothes is tailored, all that type of niggas take pride because they South niggas. And they know it took a lot for South niggas to even get in them rooms. Mm -hmm. We finna come through clean. We're not finna show up, you know what I'm saying, looking, whatever. Niggas wearing suit, I'm gonna have a clean suit. You know what I'm saying? Like, niggas wearing jewelry, watch me. Watch this, I'm gonna show you how a South nigga do it. I take so much pride in watching the show. I just went to Paris with Slim. Boy, I tell you, if Slim Thug ain't learned from Pimp C, I don't know who he learned from. <laughs> and he a yellow nigga yeah, too. true South nigga. And he a yellow nigga too, that's the other thing. He put on. And they're putting on for the city, man. It's a lot of niggas putting on, man. I'm proud of these niggas. I really am. They doing them a credit. They doing them justice. By getting out here and get to this paper, man, it's so much money. And these niggas getting it. Right. I love it. I used to have to sell a, one record out of a store. These niggas make one song and sell it 13 different goddamn ways. Nigga only have to make an album. Nigga make one good record. He out of here. Look at me now. Come in there came right at the beginning of the digital era. Max that hoe out, ringtones, online sales, website, all of that shit. Dunk. And then that man woke up one day and said, man, you know, eventually this rap shit gonna play out. If our record ain't big like the last record, this, this show ain't show money ain't gonna be like that. I need, I need this show money forever. Like, I need this kind of bread that I'm getting now forever. Right. And start moving on it before the shit started going down. And he walked away from the game. Niggas, the Barry Sanders of rap. The nigga can still rap, can still make music, do all of this shit, but it ain't really necessary. I did what I came to do. I said what I said. And I see some old paper over there. I'm going to holler at y'all. Mm. Look how hard it is to get a ride model Ross now. <sighs> Think that nigga over there worried about rapping? That's probably the smallest check he get. Well, obviously not because he got the label deal and all that. He got incentives or whatever. But for these things he's trying to do, man, and the effort, the, the, the effort that it takes to make the money that he's making from all these other different businesses and everything that it takes to kind of go into the music. Now he's where Jay is. When I make an album, it's to perpetuate my other businesses. When Ho make an album, it is not about the money an album make. He'll make more money from the sponsorships than the album could make, no matter how many it sells. Mm -hmm. We know Ross. From the getting... tour partnerships that they'll produce from that type of shit. Ross getting some money. He got up and left talking to us to go get something in the middle of the conversation. <laughs> Nigga, I get, into, I get into places as a rapper. I could never, I ain't never been invited to Coachella. There's no rapper. The niggas ain't never asked me to come to Coachella and say a motherfucking word. They, look, they want them burgers again. What? Can you come back and can you do this festival too? Man, yes! You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta be open to change, man. You can't be trying to hold on to this shit for too long. God will be calling you and telling you, man, come over here, come over here. Now nah, I'm good right here. All right, my nigga. <laughs> All right. See Don't say I ain't tell you. And I ain't go, it ain't gonna be here. When you get back. When you get back. Yeah, you know what right. I'm saying? It ain't gonna be here. Right. Mm -mm. It came to me with that. I said, let's go. Been gone ever since. Well, I I've been to the to the restaurant in in Houston, and uh, we had a conversation. And a lot of the stuff that you said to me in that conversation stuck out. But one of the things that was that was profound was, you know, you getting to a point where you realize that you know, the business of UGK got to a certain point, and you realized that it was something else that you needed to be doing, and you didn't know it was this, but the way that the person presented it to you, you knew. Is there a way to be able to tell? Like, is there, like, being somebody that's been in the business for so long, like, is there a feeling that you get or is there some type of notion that you get to know when it's time to move I, though you've been around it so long? I do the rodeo every year, right? I do the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo every year in Houston. It's the biggest rodeo in the world, but it's also the biggest music festival in the world. Most people don't know this. They do 21 concerts in a row every night in the football stadium. And the rodeo and, and everything is separate from the concert. So you buy a ticket and you can go into the carnival and go to the pet and zoo and all of that. But if you want to go into the concert, you got to buy another ticket. Mm -hmm. So they'll do about 2.2 million concert tickets. So, and it's a football stadium. And it's not like when you go see Beyonce and they got the big stage. And so a piece of the stadium, it's in the, the stage is in the center of the football field. So every seat in that bitch is up for sale. 
You know what I'm saying? They seat 70, and after 70,000, it's standing room only. I'm the first black man from Houston. It's been happening in Houston. This is the 92nd year. It's been going on for 92 years. I'm the first black man from Houston to ever headline. Mm. We've done That's it. That's hard. We've done, hard. It. We've done it twice before. We did it in 2022. We did it. We did 73,000 people. We did it last year in 2023. We did 74,000 people. We're getting ready to do it again in March, and I'm putting together the artists for it. And I try to put together a mix of try to get some younger people. When I say young, I'm 50, so I'm talking about, you know, 35, 36. Right. Try to put these youngsters on. Young. Put these young niggas in the game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, uh, but I also try to give it up to my OGs as well. I try to give it up to people that were, were trendsetters for me. And I called an artist. I'm not going to say this artist's name at all. I called an artist. And I asked this artist to be a part of it. And the artist said, I would really love to, I, you know, I, I, I have respect for you. I think we just did something together, which we had. We had just performed somewhere together a couple months before. But she was like, you know, I just, I just don't see it being worth just getting out of my house to go rap no more. I just don't see the value in it. LL is out. LL is going on tour, but LL's got a liquor deal. LL's got merchandise. He's got several different corporate sponsors that underwrite it. When people sell, you know, certain liquor in the building, he's getting money from so many different factors. And that's what I want to do. That's the only way I want to move right now. And I don't have to move if I don't want to. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just going to pass. I appreciated the fact that that person was able and willing to explain to me something that I felt like I was starting to understand. You got to get yourself to a position in life where you go to work because you want to, not because you have to. My grandfather was, I don't know, probably close to 90 years old. My grandfather had retired. The house was paid for. He didn't have to. And he would get up every morning and go tend to the yard and go out in the field and go do all this stuff. And he'd be like, why is Papa doing it? Can't Papa pay somebody to do that? Yeah, of course he can. But, but he enjoyed that. He, 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 he don't want to sit down and get stuck. You know, if you sit down for too long, you get stuck. And I'm just trying not to get stuck. You know what I'm saying? Now, this artist is not stuck. This artist has other options. They can do a multitude of things. But if they're going to do that, we got to do it different. I really can't fuck with it. Mm -hmm. I really just can't fuck with it. And that's kind of where I'm at now. You know, I got some great business opportunities in front of me that could go a, a long way. So when I come out and rap now, it's because... I've known the promoter for a while. He do good business. It's easy, and I can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We go to certain cities now. We just go because we know we can go eat somewhere, and mm -hmm. we get to see so-and-so now. Chill. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Relax. Let's go. Oh, we going to Indianapolis. We get to go eat this, and we'll see DJ Prince in them. Oh, we going to Atlanta, so we know we get to go eat here, and we'll get to mm -hmm. see so-and-so in them like that. This just, yeah, no, and, and you just got to, but you got to think about this shit before. Getting paid in the back room with guns. Man, like for, hey man, look, that shit get old, bro. That shit get old. That shit get old, man. Getting paid, you know, having to have pistols when you go to work, man. Huh? And it's legal shit. And you still got to bring a pistol to work. Like it's crazy. Like I'm, I'm working in the wrong rooms. Man. You know what I'm saying? I, and look, we'll go back and we'll go to Birmingham and we'll go to Lafayette. You know, we'll, we'll go to these smaller markets, Mobile and Jackson, Mississippi. We'll still go back because we've been going for 25. I've been going to. I've been going to Jackson, Mississippi with Stokes for 32 years. Why not go back for 33? I already know the two times a year ain't going to call. I know what's going on in town. It's a good time to get a lot of people, be some good food and shit, get to hang out. It's comfortable. It's cool. It's easy. You know? Is he going to pay me with my time? Really? Well, not really, but I ain't doing nothing this weekend anyway. Right. I'll go out there and fuck with it. You know what I'm saying? It's comfortable to be able to be at this level of life to be able to make those kind of decisions. You know what I'm saying? I got, like I said, I got grandbabies now, man. You know, I, I turned down concerts to go to cheer competitions, my nigga. Hey. <laughs> like, I turned down good, old-fashioned, hard currency to go spend them some time with them babies. Because there's times when, when the kids were younger and I, I, you know, I, I would work on Thanksgiving because they pay extra on Thanksgiving. And I work on Christmas Eve because they pay extra on Christmas Eve. You work on New Year's Eve. But if you ever worked on Christmas Eve, you come back home Christmas Eve. It's all good. Not bad. What the fuck I'm doing? <laughs> but if you go work on Christmas Eve and you come home, you can't even play with them babies like you want to. They, they already been up. You, they done open toys and shit, man. 
you know, I'm building my company now, man. And two of the people that that run this company with me, man, they he misses he missed his child walking. He missed the first word. Because he's doing things that he know will benefit this child later. But that shit still hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That shit still hurt. Can't buy time. Mm-mm. Can't buy time. And so that's, if you live long enough and you're blessed with the opportunity of having children, and no children are blessed with having children, you try to you try to right those wrongs. You know what I'm saying? You try to do things with the grandkids that you couldn't do with your, your kids. Kid. That's why the grandparents always treat the grandkids a little bit better. And you know what your kids say? Mm. Who the fuck is this nigga? Right. Because right. Right. <laughs> I didn't get that nigga. Who the fuck is this nigga? Yo, Papa, I don't even know this man. Right. Not this gangster. I don't know right. this man at all. Right. This man just did makeup at right. tea parties. <laughs> That's what my brother knew. Oh, you getting the good daddy. Yeah, man. Ain't he mad at me, nigga? You getting the best. Hey, man, I, ain't I even was even telling that longer than you. I ain't even telling him. Welcome back to the 85 right. South Show. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's the hardest intro of all times right there. That was it. <laughs> That's the hardest intro of all time. Chico, we ain't bringing nothing but legends through here. Man. It was a great day today. It was a great day. It was a good day today. A great day. It was a great and day. And I already knew coming in and talking with him, he was gonna want, he was gonna want to know this deep UGK shit. Oh the man. Very deep, we ain't profound even got shit. Started. And I knew I was gonna get emotional, but this is a safe space, I feel like. Most yes, definitely. Man, honest, safe. Right. Chico, do the intro, everybody man. Everybody's gonna see this, right? Man. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, everybody's everybody gonna, gonna see, see it, it, man. Good. Whole world gonna see it. Good, I'm good with that. Man, it brings me great pleasure to have one of the most prolific MCs in hip hop history from, in my opinion, the greatest hip hop group in hip hop history. You biased, but I give you that. I don't give a fuck. (laughs) Yes, I am. Keep going. I'm beyond biased. Keep going. I'm talking about from riding dirty to, I mean, the list goes on and on. Pocket full of stones, too hard to swallow. I mean, one of the most profound lyricists, I mean, that has given game all the way through and through for years. Okay, I mean, help okay. raise me. Now, one of the most prolific businessmen with Trill Burgers, some Keep of the going. most delicious burgers you'll ever have. And I had one that wasn't even made out of meat and it was good. You hungry? I had one before they had the stove. He did. <laughs> he was making them bitches backstage. That's how serious he is, Back. man. Literally, Ooh. an honor and Ooh. a pleasure to introduce the one and only Bun B. <laughs> Thank y'all, yes, thank y'all so much, thank y'all. Yes, sir, Come on, I got to stand up too, shit, man. Yes, sir, Steve. I ain't gonna act like I'm better than niggas, man. Oh, man. Man, that was hard. Oh, man. What I owe you for that, Jay? Nothing, you don't owe me nothing, man. You giving all you already needed to give. You deserve all of it, man. You the OG, man. I had to say, man, it's, you know, I'm not, a lot of shit is not lost on me. And... I was a fan of this show. I, I've kind of been trying to get on this hoe. You know what I'm saying? It's just y'all and then it's Club Shay Shay, and I think I might be done. I appreciate it. But I remember, I don't tell the story a lot. I remember when I when I did Big Pimper. I'm not gonna get into the, the shit about making the record. I remember I was at the office, was talking to Dame, and then Hove came in and there was the day that we were set to record the song, and the nigga said, man, you hungry? You want to get something to eat? I said, yeah, I'm cool. So we went downstairs, and we got in a nigga Bentley, and we riding around through Manhattan. Like, and I'm like, I just saw this nigga video where this nigga was in this car riding around right. Manhattan. The shit felt so surreal. And that's kind of how it feel like right now in this room, because I have seen y'all talk to so many niggas in this room and had these conversations. And I'm actually on the sofa. And here's the craziest shit of all. So y'all know when we, we, y'all came to Houston, I came to the show. Me and right. the wife came to the show. And I told my wife, I was like, you know, I'm going to do, going to do 85 South. She said, oh, for real? She's like, well, y'all, well it's just a, like, y'all just be talking. She's like, I'm like, no, it's a whole video show. You got to sit down in the room and all that. She said, oh, so that's why the stage got the sofa and everything? Nigga, I... <laughs> I was two days old when I realized that, that this shit was a replication down to the shit on the hang off shit completely. <laughs> and I'm, but, but here's why. Because I watched it from the side. Yeah. Mm. I didn't watch it from the crowd. So I didn't get this right. perspective. Right. I'm going to watch you niggas being silly 
but from the side of the stage. It never, but keep, to be fair, she was on the side too, and she figured it out. So what they tell you about me? Yeah. I married up. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk your job. I married up. Man. Did you know even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer from the other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap. 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is only good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfer is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in Good standing. Robinson Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Bluechew.com and go get you some so you can make love to your lady. So look, February is here, which is the official love making month. That's right. So to make sure your tool is in good working order, holler at them good folks over there at Bluechew.com. They can definitely get you right. Trust me when I tell you that. The process is so easy. You just sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you approve, once you approve, your prescription gonna be there within days. I'm talking about maybe one, maybe two. It just depends on where you live. One of the best things about it, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And we got a special deal for our listeners because we be looking out for people. You can try Blue Chew for free. That's right. All you got to do is go to BlueChew.com, use promo code 85SOUTH, and check out and just pay $5 for the shipping. That's right. That's BlueChew.com, promo code 85SOUTH to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more important details and say the information and we thank them good people over there at Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. Now you had went on a legendary feature run. What's the most features you think you've done in a day? In a day? In a day. <laughs> in a day. Because it's saying that shit seems so Knock effortless to you, G. You ain't fumbled on no fucking verse. Nobody has recorded my vocals more than the gentleman over there in the hoodie, Corey Moore. Oh, he get a whole separate interview. Yeah. Well, I already got Corey Moore. Corey Moore gonna do the follow-up. And when I say nobody's recorded me more, I mean more songs over a period of time or more verses in a day. Um, the only project that I don't think you recorded me at all for, Corey, was no mixtape. I think you didn't do that. And, and so that was the freestyle. Out, but I think I, I think on one day I did like seven, but they're not features, that was songs. So mm. but you recorded me for features. How many features do you think you've seen me do in one day? And when we say one day, explain how many features and and explain the time. Because the, the time is the is the thing. It's not it's not the number of songs, it's how quick we do these. Turn around. Yes. I try to come after traffic is done in the morning, but I need to be gone before, before traffic, traffic started the evening. You got to pick them so kids, pick them niggas up. kids up and all that shit. I wake up full of, I'm ready to go. When I wake up in the morning, I'm a bundle of motherfucking energy, like they say. I landed in Atlanta at 11.15. I got to the studio at 12 o'clock. I laid two verses and a hook and left the studio at 12.30 and came here. Damn. Damn. But you said that. And I'm I, going to the studio as soon as I leave here. I seen you say that it don't take you long to rap. Like, it don't take you long. So do you think that, well, 
where does that come from? Having you know, something to say. Mm. Having something to say. That's the only thing that complicates you when you have writer's block. You really ain't got shit to say. Mm. That's what writer's block is. It's not a block of thoughts. It's a lack of thoughts. Mm. You ain't taking in enough information. You're not interacting enough with the world. You're not paying attention to what's around you. So you really ain't got nothing to talk about but what's inside your four walls. And that's going to run dry very, very quickly. Mm. So, so you got to be out, man. You got to be reading. You got to be watching. You got to be talking. You got to be seeing. You got to take in the world. If you don't take in the world, what the fuck are you talking about? You gonna end up just making up shit. That's the problem. People not taking in enough information. And you don't have to be old. That's a very big misconception. You don't have to live long to have wisdom. Wisdom don't come from being old and smart. Wisdom comes from seeing things as they really happen in the world and learning how to adjust to these things. That's where wisdom comes from. It's not from being perfect and smart. It's about from being imperfect but resourceful. Mm. Yes, sir. So... I'm sorry, I ain't mean to... No, no, no. no, 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 no that's what we love. love. That's why you came in with that newspaper. We love, we love that. Like, <laughs> but so, I, would say, I would say to answer your question, seven, would that be safe? And then they giving us the least, man. Because I'm not in the studio all day. I'm not trying to do all that shit all day. I'm not. Most people go to the studio to avoid home. Right. I work very hard to get to a house that I don't want to leave. Right. I'm not trying to leave my house. People don't understand that part. God damn. Why you do it? Yes, sir. I feel. That's the whole point of it, man. You're supposed to work hard enough to to get the home that you can retire in. Yep. I learned that from Brewster's Millions. Yep. You ever seen the movie Brewster's Brewster Millions? Brewster. Yeah, Brewster. yeah. He spent all that money trying to find the room he could die in, mm -hmm. right? And at the end, when all the money was gone, the woman had finally given him, he was like, this is it. This is the room I could die in. That imprinted on me. I want to work hard enough to get the money, to get the house that I want to die in. That'll be the next house. I got a nice house right now. But the burger house? The burger house, The yeah. burger house? The burger house. That's what we got to call it. The burger house. The burger house. house. The burger house. The burger house. The burger house. house. We want some yard yard. I don't want a bigger house. I want a, a bigger, bigger plot. Bigger plot. I want some yard yard. Land. I don't need no more house. Ain't but me and her. Would you stay, would you stay in Texas for it? Yeah, that's where oh, the land at. That's where it's at. I mean, Georgia yeah. got some too. I mean, yeah, I, that's I'm too going. far to move everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, too far to move. I done already. I done already started plotting down there. I'm coming. Yeah, no, man. I want land. I want land. You got to be an executive, right, Def Jam? Yes. Work on the executive side. So somebody who done had bad record deals and then get to work as an executive, like, what did those worlds collide at? So what I did, I was basically the a and R for Def Jam South. So by the time I come into it, you done already signed your deal. Right. So I can't really do nothing about that. Right. If you ain't signed a good deal, I can't really do nothing about that. And I can't knock you because I signed one of the worst deals in history. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. We'll get to that later. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Room. I won't get but, that. Um, you still I dealing just, with it now? My deal, my record deal? The bad one. Yeah, uh, I'm still in debt. You know what I'm saying? The way my splits work and everything, I'm still in debt for about $2 million. But I've also been around long enough that my catalog will, re my catalog will revert to me and my balance will go to zero. Because I'm what they call a legacy artist. I was signed before 2000. Mm -hmm. The only reason that it hasn't all reverted and I haven't got my zero balance yet is because UGK took money after 2000. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we took money in 2007. So technically, there's seven years on the end of where we should have stopped. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think from here, what is it? It's 24 might be 27 or 28, something like that. I think all of this stuff is going to start reverting back. I could be wrong by a year or two, but I also know that's when UGK will be eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh -huh. I'm very interested to see how that goes. Yes, yes sir. sir. All the way. But it's going to be, it's, it's, to be fair, it's a couple of niggas that's supposed to be in there before I get there. Mm -hmm. right. But I'm, I am eligible, so whenever y'all get around to it, I'll let you, boy. No oh, I'll let sure. you, boy. Now, what do you think? Being as though you'd have been rapping for so long, do you have a favorite Pimp C, I mean, a favorite Bun B verse that you've done? I do. Like if you had to put one in a in a time capsule when they open it up that defined you when they listen to it, which oh, person? now you say defined me. You asked what my favorite was. Goddamn, the, yeah, that, well, the, the one that up. defined me got to be like highlight for some shit like that. Um, 
Um, I think I think Blood on the Dash, um, which is a record I recorded with Gary Clark Jr. I think that's a very very interesting record because it's a record about a police interaction from the perspective of the officer and the perspective of the person getting pulled over. So you get to see why the person got pulled over. You get to see what the cop is thinking as he walks to the car, what the person in the car is thinking as the cop walks to him. It's a very different kind of record, and it, it ends like kind of where they interact with it. You never know how these things go. That's why I left the, open, the ending open, because you never know how these kind of interactions will go somewhere. But I did try to, without taking the police side, make sense as to why a cop would be scared at work. Now, you know let me ask saying? you this. This is a, this is a question I'm I always... I'm talking about a cop that's scared at work, not a bully cop looking right. to do something. This is a question I, I feel like a lot of nervous police that shot people. I feel like a lot of nervous niggas that shot people, too. Mm -hmm. right. I digress. Now, in the rap, on, on Woodwell, you said that uh, you was a conservative liberal. Liberal, yes. That's true? Technically, yeah. But financially, I'm conservative, but lifestyle, I'm liberal. I don't really care what you do in your bed. Just don't fuck with my money. Okay. Capitalist. Yeah. That well, it. I'm, look, I'm, I'm still a philanthropist, though, right? I'm charitable. So I'm not about just making money for me. Typically right now, at this point, a lot of the money that I'm trying to make won't even benefit me. I'll be dead and gone. Generation. You know what I'm saying? So it's more about generational wealth, but Thanks. also with financial empowerment on top of it. Because it's, it's easy to leave somebody's, you know, money, but if a nigga don't, don't know, know how to, to do manage, manage $500, Giving you more money not going to help you. People don't get financial education when they get money. They get financial education, and then they get money. Right. Now, you one of the guys works. that the hip-hop community leans on, uh, like, the, the one that they grab up when they need somebody to go talk sense. This nigga turning into Charlie Rose like a motherfucker. Like a motherfucker. <laughs> like, yeah, let me cook. It's 24. <laughs> but, like, you want to know it? Huh? <laughs> no, nigga, this Oh, the boy, you fucked me up. God. You fucked me up. You fucked me up. I was like, wait a minute, where that boy's come from? Nigga, he got a one. out loud for real. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, when they want, they want to hear somebody talk sense or, you know what I mean, be the voice of reason or something, you're one of the guys that they go get. Like, how does that feel to be that in that position? Out of all the rappers, man, they go get you to, to make sense of some shit or talk to them white people when they need somebody to make sense. You're not lying, because you were there. I done seen them in the cover bar. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm just you, you can go talk. You can go downtown and talk to the mayor Why and, and get shit. Why would you ask somebody that ain't been through nothing to talk about something? Right. That's the problem. We put a lot in the lap of the younger artists and think they supposed to. They ain't been through enough shit. Some of these dudes just ain't really been through enough shit. They ain't, politics really hasn't come into play in their life in that way. You know what I'm saying? So why would you ask them what they think about politics? They probably don't they think don't about care. politics. You know what I'm saying? They maybe just don't have a frame of reference. It ain't that they don't know. Here's, here's the thing. Sunday morning in the black household, you, it's, it's music it's like Maze, Earth, Wind, and Fire, maybe some church music. That's what's playing in the house, in the black home on Sunday morning. And the white home is Meet the Press, This Week with George Stephanopoulos, you know what I'm saying? Face the nation. See, that's the shit I'm talking about. You know how to say shit like Stephanopoulos. Like that. <laughs> well, that's just a name, my nigga. It's not a noun. It's not what a noun. What name was? What you said? Stephanopoulos. Shit's not a noun. Uh, George Stephanopoulos. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanopoulos. But that's just it, man. You know, other people in other cultures typically have an earlier entry point into these conversations. Black people don't even really talk about election and politics, but every four years. Meanwhile, well, it's how the niggas, important it is. Yeah, but meanwhile, it's the niggas that's on your city council and your school board. They get elected every two to three years, depending on where you live at. Those are the people that are really making decisions that affect your everyday life. That, those are the people that decide whether or not that pothole on your mama's street get filled. Right. That type of shit. You know what I'm saying? But that's just not something that we're told is important on a daily basis. They don't teach civics in school no more, but even if they did teach civics in school, it wouldn't matter because... It ain't got shit to do with test scores, and that's really all they do in school now is teach kids how to pass state tests so they can keep funding or whatever. They really don't care about actually teaching kids things that could actually ben benefit them further in life. Because passing a, a, a state examination test ain't got shit to do with making money and prospering in this world, not a motherfucking thing. So when young people tell you they don't want to go to college, whatever, look what school was. School wasn't shit. Right. It didn't even really engage a lot of these kids. If you're not in an AP class or honors class, you don't even, your intellect isn't even really engaged, right? They like you. And let's be very, very real. 
we got a lot of kids in school that don't even want to be in school. Right. In the classroom with kids that actually do want to learn something. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. We got classrooms, 35 kids in the room, 12 kids trying to learn, and 23 kids fucking off, right? Because due to home situations, concerns, or lack of involvement in their life, lack of engagement at home, you know, God knows what kind of environment they see and they live in every day. It's this, there's no one pushing them into an alternative that could benefit them. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so they take that frustration. Somebody said some ill shit the other day. Somebody said, children should sleep in the bed with their parents till they're seven years old. Because up until then, children are very, very scared. He said, when a child is in their bedroom by themselves and they get scared and nobody's there, that's when peeing in the bed starts. That kind of stuff. That's the behavior. Because they're having nightmares and dreams and they're alone. They say, when children sleep in the bed with their parents, they tend to not pee in the bed because if they wake up scared, somebody's going to rub them, caress them, console them in the moment. You know what I'm saying? We have to do a better job of nurturing our children. We can't keep giving kids phones and iPads. It ain't shit. And they understand it better than you. So how the fuck can you monitor your children's social media page when, A, you don't know enough about social media, B, you on social media fucking off <laughs> and DMs and shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Aggie, who got, who got, how, your daughter. Your daughter's a teenager, right? 15. Your daughter's 15. Did you teach your daughter how to create an email account, or has your daughter had to teach you how to create an email account? No, I taught her. But the thing, but the thing is, though, that I do with my daughter is I let her lead in regards to the social aspect because I want to make sure that it's not something that she feels like she needs to hide from me. I want her to show me all the tricks. I want her when some new shit come out and that's that the, the youngest is doing, I want her to be like, Daddy, check this out. Look what they're doing now. So yeah. I can be like, oh, all right, I'm hip. Because I know that there's no way I'm going to be able to be in tune with this machine the same way she is. Like right. something I always say is the Etch-A-Sketch was the iPad. At one point, that was the most profound technology we had was the Etch-A-Sketch. Now it's the iPad. So eventually, something going to make the iPad just as irrelevant as the Etch-A-Sketch. And I want to be in tune with somebody who's going to grow with it to make me understand it to where I'm not coming in blind trying to and looking like an old nigga and getting circles ran around. See, and that's the thing, right? But you, I, the way I look, I feel like you have a very, and I see it in the video, I feel like you have a very different dynamic with your daughter. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very understood that you're the father, she's the child, right? Mm -hmm. But y'all get along. Mm -hmm. Like, you get along with a teenage girl. That's mm -hmm. amazing, my nigga. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I know nothing of this. Mm -hmm. yeah, I did not get, we did not get along with our teenage daughter like this. My granddaughter is 15 years old. Bump heads constantly. Like, you know what I'm saying? But you're right. You do have to be more involved with your kids. But I feel like you've been involved before the social media oh, yeah. and the electronics Yo. come in. Typically, I don't know how many situations I've been in where the parent is trying to do something, the child is bothering them, and the parent is like, here, just take the phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just take the phone, mm -hmm. you know? You ever tried to buy a kid a Fisher Price cell phone? Man, they look at that shit. Like, what the fuck is this? Is this the box? Right. Where yours? You That's how no. they look at you. They look at that Dang. shit. They look at your phone. What the fuck is this? Hey. D give me the app, nigga. Give me the, the birds and the bubbles and the shit. Like, right. what are you doing? I remember my daughter found a Game Boy and asked me what type of phone this was. I said, damn. I'm, woo. Game like that, she found a Game Boy. She was like, "Daddy, what type of phone is this?" I'm like, that ain't no damn phone. That's a Game Boy. She was like, "Well, where the phone at?" You know what I mean? And then for like for me, I just know that I think it comes from me not having a father because I don't have no reference point. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to go back to that a father is supposed to do with their child. So I'm making it up as I go. Right. So a lot of things that I'm sure if I had my dad, I probably would be restrictive because it came from and just passed down. I don't have that. So. I'm more open-minded. Yo, what's happening? It's your boy DC on Fly back at it again with Prize Picks NBA All-Star Weekend just passed, you dig? So you know we're about to see some good basketball before the playoffs, okay? So go right now and download Prize Picks right now and use the promo code 85SOUTH, all right? Getting started is so easy. You register for an account, make it a deposit, and pick more or less on two to six player stats to win payouts of up to 25 times your entry 
all first time users that deposit and use your promo code will receive a 100% instant deposit matchup up to $100. So if you deposit $100, you already know PrizePick gonna give you $100. If you deposit 85, PrizePick is gonna match your $85. Available in over 30 states. What you waiting for? Go ahead and download Prize Picks right now and tap the link below. Download Prize Picks today and play daily fantasy sports. Make sure you use our promo code 85 South when you sign up. Tell them DC Young Fly sent you. You need. with a lot of things when it comes to my daughter in regards to letting her lead because I know that when I was her age, like for example, when we was home for Christmas break, she got a little boyfriend. The boyfriend came to the house. They baked cookies and all that at the house. And I just, you know, naturally was appreciative of the fact that this little girl is a much better human being than I was at 15 because I got cameras all in my house and I can see what they was doing. They really was just and they're being kids. If my mama had cameras in that house when I was 15, she'd have had footage of me jerking off all around that bitch. I'm talking about nothing but me jerking off all around her apartment, nigga. Ain't nowhere in the world I could have been in there That's with funny. some cameras and then let alone a girl, nigga, I'd have been fucking in her bed. Like, ain't nowhere in the world. So just me understanding that <clears throat> dynamic lets me know that, okay, I got a good baby, so I can't be... I can't act like she's like me yeah, and be as restrictive bear. like I was bear. when you I was so her age. The cookies? They made some cookies. Like, this look like biscuits. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was there. Oh, but yeah, I wasn't out. I ain't, I ain't got that yeah. Right, that's the thing, right? When, when you are trying to raise your child with the best of intentions, right, and you don't let the worst of you be the reason why you make a certain decision, you don't let how you feel in the day to determine how you make a decision, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not your child gets to go somewhere depend on how you feel in that day. That that's, that doesn't sound like that. You know what I'm saying? If mm -hmm. the child has earned the right to go and do something, we should do it regardless of how it inconveniences us. These are the kind right. of things. You have to be very intentional into what you're doing and why you're doing it. But the child has to also be aware enough to see that, you know what, I know a lot, my, I got a lot of friends, they got a lot of daddies, they daddy do stuff for them and with them, but not like my daddy. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, my right. dad is really, really, like trying to be a daddy. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's just important for children. Most children want to know that they can depend on their parents. Whether they show you the appreciation or not, whether they, you know, you butt heads and all of that shit, man, at the end of the day, when the bullshit is going on, they call home, their mama gonna pick up, and even if mama gonna be mad that a motherfucker, mama come and get me. You know what I'm saying? That right there. That security. That, that shit goes a long way. You know what I'm saying? Telling the kids, look, if you fuck up, just call me. I'm going to come get you. You fuck around and get to drinking with somebody. You know you drunk. Don't get no call with nobody. They don't tell them what they're going to do. Call me. They I'm going to come get you. Trish. We'll talk about it in the morning. That was always the thing. Like, whatever happened, mom, we got pulled over by the police. All right, we finna come get you. Right. You know, we going to handle this and we fuck around. Get into it with the police. You know right. what I'm saying? But tomorrow, you have to explain to me about this shit. But we're we going to do what we need to do as a family. Tonight. Let's come and see if I can get you before we put you in the car. Right. If they put you in the car, we're going to go down there and get you. You know what I'm saying? It all went bad. My wife ended up in the car. Um, <laughs> uh, you got the wrong motherfucker, man. <laughs> no, they, that day they had the right one. That's the thing. Yeah, the that right, day right fucking, with, fucking with her child, they had the right one. I think that, that, that's one thing I do with my daughter. Like, if I make a promise, and she know, because I'm like, her friends, dad, they, they do whatever their job is. But I'm like, you also got to understand that your friends' parents are successful as well. They just do different jobs. Right. Your daddy is an entertainer. This is why I be gone so I can do the But I'm here to tell you, it's not going to be like that for too long. I'm going to tell you what. I got to retire early. Because first of all, I want to. And like you said, you want to retire in the house. You want to die. Yet. Absolutely. So I don't want to be out here doing all this extra work. So what I'm trying to tell you is, you're in the first grade. I got time, but I ain't got too much time. I'm trying to make sure I be there at least by middle school. So 
You fifth grade, it, and that, sixth grade. And oh, baby, dad at home every goddamn day. Baby. That's with, that's with the blessing of being like almost immediately successful. And when I say immediate, some people it take 10, 15, 20 years. If you crack that nut in the first five years, you beat the game. Right. Like you beat the game from the first time you pick up the pen to the day you sign that paper. In five years, you beat the game like a motherfucker. Gotta go. You gotta go. It take way longer than that for a motherfucker to pick up a basketball. And bouncing for five years and getting the NBA unless he's seven foot two. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Some shit like that. So, no, nah, and and it's kind of hard to designate what hard work is in entertainment. Right. Right? Because it's not physical labor, but it's physically taxing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Spending a lot of time with creative energy, it takes a lot out of the body. People don't know that. So you're traveling. That, you know what I'm saying? Brain. Traveling, getting up, getting up. My body don't even know how to work when I'm at home now. You know what I'm saying? I will automatically wake up about 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, not just because I'm old, because my body expects me to have to get up and go to the airport. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I never miss flights. I don't miss nothing because my body already know. I don't be tired dragging through the airport. They ain't I don't need, you go to sleep. I don't, who, me? I can't go to sleep. I go to sleep when I get tired. I fall asleep. I don't go to sleep. I can't lay in the bed and just go to sleep. I can't do it either. That don't just work for me. I get in the bed when I'm tired. But just like, time to go to bed? What the fuck that mean? Right. <laughs> My body don't know what the fuck that mean. I done been to sleep at every... I've probably been asleep in a 24-hour period every goddamn minute. Facts. At the end of the day. At some point in my life, I done been asleep... What time is it right now? I done been asleep on one of the time I done been right asleep now. at this time of day. One time. Many time. times. Right. <laughs> Many times, you know what I'm saying? Right. When I'm tired, my pastor told me a long time, shout out to Pastor August, Walter August. And man, I say, my wife get mad because I be taking naps in the daytime. He say, why do you take naps in the daytime? I say, because I be tired. He say, why are you tired? I say, because I work long nights. That's just the rest of your sleep. Yeah. Your sleep, your, the eight hours that you're supposed to get at night, catching up. yours, young man, are broken down in three one and a half, 45 minutes, 115, like your eight hours are accumulated. Mm -hmm. So when you tired, go to sleep. Like when you tired, go to sleep because you're no good to nobody unrested. And me, I can, it, it trips my wife out. I'll have, a, let's say I got a perform at one o'clock. It take 30 minutes to get from the hotel to the club. I'm gonna sleep till 12, 15. Fast. I'm gonna sleep till 12, 15, get up, jump in the shower, get dressed, go downstairs. Let's go. And she'd be like, what did you get out of that? How the fuck could you have gotten anything out of that? I'd be jumping around like a, like a rabbit. And that mother like, what you mean? I'm ready to go. Come right Let's back, do this. Lay right back down. My wife lay down for 30 minutes. She going to continue to lay down. Be out of here. Beyond for several 30 minutes. <laughs> People ain't no good. But I don't, I, because of how we used to move and the place we had, I used to have to stay in hotels with the front door exposed. Like La Quinta Inn, Red Roof, that type of shit. Right. I come up in that era. Well, even the nice hotel, you was exposed to the, to the street. So right you outside, go, yeah, so on you the go. Door. You can hear the traffic. It be certain days <laughs> where, it be certain days where you have a show and I'm old and I can talk about this shit. It be certain days where you be like, damn, it was some fine ass girls in that club. So when the cars start turning, because they already know, they got an idea where the rappers are staying when they come to the town. Right. So when them cars start turning around, you be picking out the room, see if it's a car full of girls, then you go stand outside and act like you smoke a weed. <laughs> 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 but then you go to that gangsta-ass city, right? Where you can tell them niggas is lurking. Hey, man, get back to this motherfucking room. Right. Close them blinds. Be cut the lights off. Of lock them doors. Don't let them niggas know where you at. I hope you got ice and sodas in your room. Right. Because we leave this club, we're going straight to that hoe. Fast. <laughs> Shut it down. And then you see them niggas lurking mm -hmm. around that hoe. Because they know they all they need to find out what door. That door kicked in. It kicked in. That door's kicked in. I tell them now, no doors on the outside. It took a lot. It took a lot for us to start flying. Pimp never got comfortable with flying. Because he couldn't bring no pistol. Oh, yeah. Oh, Y'all old yeah. school, old school. But he couldn't bring no pistol. Y'all ain't driving New York. Y'all came up during the time when it was really real, when you show up and... Wasn't no way to put no insurance on yourself by going live and talking crazy and letting niggas know, that, oh, yeah, we, we going to do that. Hey, insurance? That. Shit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Nigga. Well, that's you were going to the city and there was heavy gangster shit going on. You tried to get in quietly. Right. You know what I'm saying? Lay low. Yeah, you know them west side niggas and them, and them north side niggas beefing out here. I don't even. Where the show at? 
Show on the east side. Fuck, that mean niggas from both sides come. Oh, mm-hmm. Chico, I'll tell you, we'll, okay. sw- we'll switch again. Let's be room in a minute. minute. What? We'll be Fuck around be here in the city and then they, they didn't yeah. get a nice lick. Yeah, nah. I'll uh, switch the room. Hell anyway. no. Nah. If I get to a city and the motherfucker too excited to see me at the there. front desk, I'm not staying at that I hotel. Nah. First of all, nigga, hell no. Nah. First of all, a promoter yeah, ain't. Let me tell you, no promoters don't book my travel, no, my hotel, and none of that shit. I still got to do my sound check, my nigga. You know, you stop doing that shit then. No, I book my own travel. I, about to say. I don't name no nigga. I'll I see wish you at that sound check and at the show. I start booking my but own travel. But we won't come travel. bring, we won't come drop the money off. I'll see you at sound check. I said. I start, <laughs> I start booking my travel when I realized this nigga, I was his hanging I was his 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 show off. <laughs> and nigga done booked the room right he done, next door. No, he done booked me <laughs> to hang with him. <laughs> nigga, we going, yeah, man, you know your room ain't ready yet, so you can just ride with me. If we go get something to eat, finna go to... Nigga, I went everywhere, and he like, I got D.C. in the car. In the first I'm year... I'm like, I'm not your bitch. In the first year of UGK, <laughs> we went to a very small town in Louisiana. This is in the first year of UGK. We went to a very, very small town in Louisiana. And we got to the Ramada Inn. That's how long ago it was. Ramada. Got to the Ramada Inn with the doors on the inside. So it was Okay, it was a nice one. <laughs> it was nice, and now, <laughs> you know nice-y. what I'm saying? And then we checking in, and the nigga was like, well, shit, here you go, my nigga. And they gave me some crack. They gave me some crack. I was like, what the fuck? You, you know, I thought y'all might want to go hang on the cuts and slay some shit while you was here. Oh, so he like, nigga gave y'all some crack to sell? That's a nice hotel. Like, just, just for us, you know, be, till we would feel more comfortable. Right. Oh, man. Damn. We're going to cup a nigga back. You turned it down, but I wonder who the nigga was like, like man, I fuck with you, bro. You a real nigga, bro. Get out here and sell this crack for this show. <laughs> <laughs> you said they outside. My name is 2-8, ball. I'm going to go crazy. Damn. Now, to be fair, it was like a quarter slab, so I probably would have made about $350, 400 That night. You know. That night. And, back then, and to be fair, back then, I wasn't making no hell of five money rapping. This Again, this first album, first year. Damn. You know what I'm saying? So Nick could have used that little extra dollars, but not that case. So 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 tell it, so tell it like, it, it, the difference from... Now, because I hear you say, like, I'm making more now than what I did back then. Now, this is when the album's popping, going crazy. So even still with show money, it was still a little bit tight. Well, it wasn't that it was tight, right? It was. It took a while for the money to catch up to the fame. Mm. See, we didn't have videos. We wasn't in magazines. So Y'all niggas really didn't even know who we was and through. shit like that until we actually went somewhere and did something. Yeah. So it became more of a word of mouth thing, like, you know, who are, did y'all see them niggas, what they look like, what they, all of this type of shit. And then we come and we do the shows and the reputation, all oh, them niggas came, it's a real niggas, and they niggas was jamming too, you know. So a reputation started to kind of spread from that, mm-hmm. you know, so we, but it's a lot different now than it was then. Right. You know what I'm saying? People would actually go to the club and be willing to listen to a motherfucker they hadn't really heard before do some music. I'm not going to hear that shit now. No. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if your shit wasn't jamming and the girls got off the dance floor, I don't even know if clubs really have dance floors no more. Yeah, All I see is tables sick. and shit. You know what I'm saying? But if the girls got off the dance floor, nigga, that was it, that was it for you. DJ might make the shit out of here type of shit. But it was... The clubs back then was a lot different than now, and it was the same. Wasn't no bottle service or none of that type of shit. Right. Um, but it was a lot more fighting. I will say it was a lot more. You know, I see now every now and then, like if it's a problem at the club, somebody will get shot. Right. That's typically when you know it's a problem at the club. Right. Somebody gets shot. And people ain't getting shot at the club every night. Right. You know what I'm saying? Every now and then people get shot, but but back then, no, it was some you you went to the club with four or five niggas, y'all better be ready to fight. There's some squabbling going on. Yeah, so when we first used to leave, we'd be in about four or five car caravan. So we was only going to small hood. We leave Port Arthur, we go to Lake Charles. They'd be ready to fight. Go to Lafayette, they'd be ready to fight. Go to Strawberries in Bro Bridge. You best be ready to fight. You go to Baton Rouge, you better be ready to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> go to New Orleans, you really got to go to New Orleans? All right, well, you got to go to New Orleans, bring your gun, but we're trying yeah, not to man. shoot because they got, they got gun guns. Yeah. They got gun guns. That was the first time I saw, like, a plurif- like, a bunch of niggas with AKs. Like, most of the niggas in New Orleans in 93 when I went, went out there. 93, that was real. I won. Who we got to talk to about getting us a trill burger out here? 
Oh, as far as what? Good franchise. No, we I need could have brought some... you one. It would have been cold and shit. No, we, but... need, no, we, a need, we need a franchise. Oh, no, it's going to be a minute before you get that here. Why? A minute before you get that here. It, this, these things take time. Damn. We're not just popping them up like that. This is a real business. It takes time. I got to figure out where I need to open up in Atlanta. And see, everybody want a franchise, right? Everybody, man, I need a franchise. I want a franchise. I'm, just tell me you want, let me hold something. <laughs> just, just tell me, let me hold something. That's but that's what you're asking when you ask for a franchise. Oh, 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 let me hold something. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me some burgers in there. That's what you want. Can't can can bring the beef. I mean, nigga, see, I got a lick and everybody want in. I get it. It's a lick. It look like well, it's playing. No, see, I don't pressed. want the lick. Instead of me <laughs> going to try to extend and help Subway, I'd rather fuck with Trill Burger. Just keep buying burgers. You're healthy. Just keep buying your burgers. Because if I just sell a franchise, that means you get to make the money. If I give you a franchise, you just going to operate it. Can I keep the money? You, play you have the franchise. No, franchise you know the franchise. Free. You got to pay the franchise fee, and don't you get a percentage of the store? I get, I get royalties. Mm -hmm. As soon as you fuck up, I get it back. I get the whole store back. Yep. Ain't nobody mm -hmm. fucking up. Ain't nobody coming in here, man. I might. I, Why I don't you want to rob a burger place? I might, place I might for only want to sell the niggas that I know going to fuck up. We ain't up. got nothing but so beef in here, right, man. So the rice revert right back. You need about three months. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all gonna buy the raw meat, try to get some cheaper bread. Hell no, nah. we're gonna nah. go through your nah, people. No, we're gonna go through the SOP. We're not gonna, gonna be in Trill Burger no, selling no, Wendy Burgers. No. The Me. powers that be. 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 Nigga, nigga have an inspection coming here and be like, these ain't Trill Burger. <laughs> Fuck at this. <laughs> Man. That's what I'm so scared of, like, letting this brand get away from me. You know what I'm saying? I because I know what I'm gonna do. Right. I know how I'm gonna I don't know how you, you know what I'm saying? And I know why I'm doing this. I built this, you know what I'm saying, because it was a really good product, and I knew that my culture could help grow this company. And it's a great way of showing how hip-hop can pretty much sell anything in this world and so that niggas can think broader. Everybody ain't going to have a burger, but everybody's going to find something from their career, from their lifestyle, from their culture that can translate to something else. The skills that I learned to sell music are the same exact skills I use to sell burgers in terms of promotion and marketing. Thanks. I knew my album was jamming, so I ain't had no problem going to the city, getting on the radio, going to a club, playing some music. You know what I'm saying? I know niggas gonna like my shit because my shit jamming. Same thing with the burger. I don't have no problem going to New York, California, Florida, St. Louis. I don't give a fuck where we gotta go with this burger. I'll take good. it anywhere because I know this bitch gonna go. Have you I always know been like known for having good burgers? Or no, no, no just not chefing up shit? Not at, not at all. Not at all. burger business. Uh -huh. Mm -mm, I ain't right never been to, I had a food blog. Well, I still got a food blog. We've been doing about 12 years now. But I ain't no hell if I cook like that. Oh. You know what I'm saying? I didn't make this burger. He brought me this burger. Asked me to be a partner. But what you, know you say that? that you don't like being in the studio, when I came to the, the, the burger spot, you was in there walking around, greeting people, being in there. Like, So is there a different passion for that than you have this for what made you? This burger is for me what UGK was for Chad. Wow. Damn. That's a hell of a statement. I right can there. see all the way to success, just like he saw with the music. It was a clear path to success. Just let us do what the fuck we do. They wouldn't let us do it on Too Hard to Swallow. They kind of tried to let us do it on Super Tight. But only until we said, man, just don't just give us some equipment and, and get the fuck out the way. And don't change nothing we give you. Like, don't change one song, nothing. If the sample don't clear, Call us and tell us, and we'll reproduce it. Right. Once they gave us what we needed to have to make the music and got the fuck out of the way, it all started making sense. And that's all I needed with this burger was an opportunity to cut through all the bullshit and just put the burger <coughs> in front of motherfuckers and let them try the burger. So I took the burger everywhere that I could go, and that's why I say Coachella would never give me a credential to even get in that hole. You know what I'm saying? I had... Artist parking. I had my own golf carts around that hole. I'm moving around these. I'm flexing around these holes. Right. You know what I'm saying? Doing, What's up, boy? I'm, I'm, I'm moving around Rolling bitch. Loud, man. Shout out to Alex and <laughs> shout out to Alex and Tarek and, and Matt and them over at Rolling Loud. I'm talking. About, I'm having it my way. Right. In that hole. You know what I'm saying? All on burn. First phone call I made to Rolling Loud. They, we, I set up a call. First, they said, "Hey, man, look, OG, we have so much respect for you, man. We're so happy to have you. You know, wanting to be interested in being a part of the festival, but." We just want to be very clear and transparent. The way we book talent over here, whoa, 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 whoa. I ain't, I ain't trying to rap. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were, no, I'm trying to do the burgers. Oh, say no more. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? They, they sent us the map. Where do you want to put them? How you want to do How you want to do that? Doors that the music could not open. A lot of people think this rap shit is going to get you everywhere you want to go. No, they want to know how you became successful 
What is your skill set? What did you what did you work hard and train to do? How does that transcribe into other spaces? When I was a rapper, I do this thing called Gumball 3000 every year. Yeah. I've been doing it for the last 13 years. These are some of the richest people in the world, like literally some of the most liquid people, not just paper money, liquid people in the world. And you know, I they had got great money, they can just race around in yeah, race cars just fucking and Lamborghinis and yeah. shit. And I've had re- amazing relationships and made great friends. But because none of them was really in the entertainment business, there was nothing really, can, can, can there, was no, there was no business to talk about. Now that I'm in this space right now, everybody is, hey, man, I do market research for this. Hey, man, I do capital funding for this. Hey, man, I do this, I do that, all of these kind of things. Now they can help me. You know what I'm saying? Now people can help you. There's probably somebody right now watching, all you niggas at home and ladies, whatever, how you, however you refer to yourself, or, you know, you don't have to use a, a derogatory term like that, but everybody watching right now, Somebody out here in your life is in a position to help you. You just won't go there. Most people train for a position. You go to a job. Hey, man, I wanna, I wanna, I'm here for job A. But we're not hiring for job A. We're hiring for job D, though. It's actually a good opportunity. Well, I've been training for job A. No, we'll train you for job D. We'll train you for that. Well, I still need to work. No, no, we'll, you know, we'll, there's a salary. We'll, you'll get some more money, and we'll train you. Because we really need people to work in D right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I really want to work in A, because A probably a glamorous job and all of that. You know what I'm saying? That's, look, we've got some open positions right now. You fighting against where God trying to pull you because you're trying to go where you think you need to be. I stopped fighting. I just was ready for opportunity to hit me. And when that hole hit me, I took that home. I took off running. I knew exactly what to do with it when it came, and I wasn't tied up into some other bullshit passing time, fucking off, just to be saying I'm doing something. You know what I'm saying? I went and did my little shows, had my other little investments and shit like that, and I sat back and I waited. And when that boy brought me that burger, I was ready to motherfucking go, and I'm still ready to go because I just touched the surface. I'm just getting started with this burger. Everything people think this burger might be, it's going to be, and then some. Mm-hmm. Trust me. I just want the cheeseburger burger in ATL, <laughs> yeah, man. man. I got to be, be careful about talking about the burger because it starts making niggas hungry. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I get to talk. That, that's my job, but, though, to make you, you want been, to eat I, that I, I give you credit because you was talking this passionately about it before it even came. When you came to do Wild and Out, me, remember me and Los, was, he was telling us about what you was great to do. Like, you know, I'm great getting to the burger business. He was like, the burger business, for real? And you was just as passionate about it then. Yeah, because so, I was eating the burger. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I it, know just, what this burger is. All the people that don't know are the people that ain't ate it. When you eat this burger, all this shit you see online... All these Instagrams and TikToks and all these that real, shit the all that shit. Man. When you see the burger and you eat that bitch, it all makes sense. Because still, right now, people that know me and love me still believe that it, it can't be that good. It's, it's no way this burger can be as good as these people say it is. I knew that shit good. Them people, his friends, dog, they're going to say that. Toby, I was at Coachella with Toby. Toby was with, um, was with, um, Earth Gang mm-hmm. is what Earth Gang was cool, in. Yeah. And I think it's Olu. Olu. Mm-hmm. Olu was there eating the burger. And Olu was like, man, this motherfucker good as hell. And Toby said, nigga, when he first brought it to me, I thought I was going to have to lie when they cut the camera off. Because that he was willing to support me regardless. Right. You know what I'm saying? But he wasn't sure if it was going to be good or not. But with the camera rolling, he still was going to act like... Right. And man, man ate the burger, the wife ate the burger, and them cheering started. When them cheering, that's where I'm from, night like kids, yeah. cheering. When cheering. them cheering started eating the burger, and them eyes get big with them cheering, you know you good to go, because you got to take them cheering where they want to go. got to get eat. something ain't to eat no, ain't, ain't no way of getting around that. That's, that's what them cheering want. And you know they're going to eat it and go be quiet somewhere? Right. Well, eat that two, three times a week. Hell yeah. But I, I knew I had it. Man. Got that? Hey, we got it. I got to ask, just for my own, Still want to pray, for my own personal, you know. I will, just it's just going to take some time. Just me wanting to know, what's your favorite Pimp C verse? God damn. Geez. Probably Shattered Dreams. Okay. Because it's a very obscure UGK record. Mm-hmm. It's lost in the middle of a lot of really, you know, very classic UGK style records. But Shattered Dreams is, is really him. Like, that's him. Like, he was the one they said was too young too short, too this, too that, was never going to make it. And I used to be like, when niggas would play me, like, my nigga, that, that shit ain't jamming, that shit ain't jamming. And people would be like, man, you can't tell people that shit. Mm-hmm. Tell them what to do better. Just don't tell them it's bad. You got to tell them what to do better, because if you don't tell them how to improve themselves, 
they ain't gonna get no better. He would always tell, but then niggas can't stand criticism. Be like, man, I ain't gonna lie, man. Your, your rhymes is cool, man, but them drums ain't gonna work. Them drums is, them drums is terrible, though. That shit ain't gonna work. You need to, who make your beats, dog? You need somebody better to make your beats. Just rap over other nigga beats to keep your style going, but you gotta find this nigga beats is trash, bro. Right. Like this. And niggas be like, hey, man, listen to my beat. All right, but when it's over, I'm gonna tell you how I feel. Right. Say, man, you can't make rap music. I don't know what it is you want to do with your life, but this ain't it. <laughs> this ain't it for you. Not like this. You got a lot more to do. Don't play no more music for nobody for about two years. That type of shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. You, you, when you put yourself out there, man, you got to be willing to accept the criticism as well as the accolades. You know what I'm saying? And Shattered Dreams was really about him saying, don't let nobody tell you you can't do it just because you ain't ready right then and there to do it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because nobody said, it wasn't a motherfucker thought we was going to be who we ended up became, eventually became. You know what I'm saying? Even his mama, who wasn't really sure about it, but supported him anyway, once she saw where this shit was going, she stopped her whole life to get behind him and support him because she saw that it was actually going to be something real, something tangible that was going to take her child very far in this world. And so she just wanted to get behind him and help. And that was a very, very unique relationship because Pimp was the only child. Pimp's mama was the only child. So he didn't have a bunch of aunties or uncles. He had them through marriage and shit like that. But it was his grandmother, his mama, and him. Mm. Like, one, two, three. And so there was no way that she was going to stand to the side and not get behind him. Because we had just got it to her with a record company, just... Fired the manager, got sued by the manager, attacked by the IRS, all this type of shit going on. And Pim Mama had a nice, comfortable company. You know what I'm saying? They owned damn near all the vending machines and put all this. So they had good money. And she gave all of that shit up, the business go all the way down, just to help him. And he eventually brought back more than the vending machines ever could have made mm -hmm. for the family. It's just those kind of things, man. Those kind of moments that really took us from where we was going to where we needed to go from somebody sewing into us, somebody believing us. Even, in, and you gotta understand, this is UGK at its worst, at its lowest moment. And somebody came in and believed in us enough to take everything they had to help us turn this shit around. And so for him, it was always about, don't let no one shatter your dreams. Don't let nobody tell you you're not gonna be who you think you can be just cause you are not that person now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody want to be cool at a certain time. Everybody want to be cool when everybody else is cool. Mm -hmm. You're in high school, you wanna, you're a freshman, you want to be cool like a senior. Mm -hmm. You're in college, you're a freshman, you want to be cool like a senior. You're a young adult, you want to be cool like older people. I always <laughs> tell people that everybody got X amount of time that they're supposed to be cool. Most people use it up very early, and there's no cool left when they get older because they didn't prepare to be old. I was told, take your youth and work hard don't try to be cool. Work hard, stack your money. You don't understand life and you got money, then you're going to really be cool. You got good credit, some cash in the, in the bank, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And you hadn't got caught up with nightlife and fucking off and, and just spending money on bullshit. All you know is about being conservative with money. Right. Now you got some real money and you can actually, now you can really spend money now. Right. Now you can spend it at, on shit that you know you're going to get everything out of. Typically, young people spend money on their company. It's collective. If we got five people and it's $20, we're going to buy $10 worth of weed, some beer, and some blunts, and, and we're going to all collectively get do that. And if one of us, if we young, get more than the rest we want it, because it's not fun being by yourself. Mm -hmm. You get older, you got some money, you're not trying to spend it on nobody. Mm -hmm. Nobody. I only have a birthday party when somebody pay me to have a birthday party. I don't want to celebrate my birthday with other mothers. My wife was very... Very adamant about that shit. We are not doing no public goddamn birthday parties. No more. Fuck that. Spending your money to go to a club so other people can have fun. The fuck is that about? But then I'm an entertainer, so I would get paid. I get paid to do my birthday party. But then that stopped being fun. You book a whole weekend of birthday shit, you know, when I Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you tired. Nigga, Thursday, I'm tired. <laughs> now y'all still got Sunday. Y'all y'all go walked in a Sunday night party miserable than the motherfucker. I'm good. I ain't going. You niggas can have that shit. How many times y'all niggas try to get money back? I won't take it. If you ever see me booked yeah. at a club, a nigga was tripping. Because what you... I charged him to go, I he must have thought I was somebody else. 
Cause I am not going. It ain't, it ain't enough money you can pay me to go in. I be in the bed you never every been here night. They pay for these head, Bob. Every now and no. then, me and my wife will go out on the road. We be in a certain city and we go get a good dinner. Mm -hmm. And if I ain't doing one of these little tours that's done by midnight, and I get on them cuffs and they call me at one o'clock talking about it's time to go to the club. Relax. Who? Man, get that nigga that money back, man. Oh, I'm about to shut down at the 11 30. Oh, boy. 11 30, I'm about to shut get down. Get that money, nigga that money back. He ain't gonna want the hat. He ain't gonna want the back end. He gonna want. Man, get that nigga that money back. Come get it. They think you coming. Come get it. Man, I don't care. Club Come get back. It. You already made your money. And he'll cover you, but you really won't get them niggas ain't money back. No, nah, nigga, I had to get out the bed down at the door. We might as well go now. Nah, shit. A promoter thought I was coming in because wasn't nobody there. He said, You still coming? I said, nigga, we are the club. I'm going I don't home. give a damn it's four people or four thousand. I'm finna come and give you the best that I got. No, but what nobody in there? No, what nobody in there? I'm rap for me, it's practice. But he ain't had my Fuck back it. end. Who get paid to go to practice? He ain't had a back end. I can see if he had the back end. Well, he might as well just sit in the car. Me and him, we just sit downstairs in the car no, the, and the, play some music and I'll rap in the passenger seat. No, my car was still driving out while we were talking. I was like, hey, oh. I'm about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> one of my, no, nigga, my money. One, I've only ever done one show where a nigga didn't have my money because an OG of mine, rest in peace, Wicked Crick, told me I needed to do it for the kid. And that's the first time and probably the last time, time I ever did it for the kid. Did it for the kid. For the kid. I give the kid some money. But I ain't but doing I ain't it for the kid. I give the kid some money. Like, let me make my money. Okay, here you go, kids. Here you what? go. The $20 for you, nigga. Here what? You go. Man. Well, I'm not. I don't know. I, no. My kid, maybe. Mm -hmm. my maybe. Kid, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You know, maybe not your mine. kid. No, no. You know how on the plane when they say you got to put the mask on yourself yeah, before you, before you help. help somebody? I can't help your kids if I don't help me. Maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. And I then can't help we need this in order to breathe, how am I going to help somebody suffocate? Put this on. No, nigga, you I got to put, put it on. You put the mask on the baby first. You try to put it on you, you pass out. The baby can't help you. Right. No, I'm not oh. Damn. Then the baby gonna fuck around and take it off himself. Not understanding the situation. That's crazy. Man. That motherfucker lives So many goddamn deal. questions, man. I, I remember you saying that uh man. that uh, you know, when you when you went and when y'all did Big Pimpin, you wanted to you felt like you had something to prove on that record as far as the lyrical part of it, you of know, course. rapping. You know what I mean? And, and being showing that the, the South got bars and the MC part of it. Do you, did that make you feel like you got there? Was it that point that you felt like, okay, now I got the respect, or was it a later point? Sometimes you go and see niggas playing basketball at the YMCA, and most niggas is just there, get a workout in, play some ball house for fun, and then you got that one motherfucker that come in there and want to hoop in the wild, like it's scouts in the goddamn bleachers in the stands or some <laughs> shit. That's how I rap. I, I decided very early that every rhyme I write could be my last rhyme. So I got to put every goddamn thing I, I want to put in these motherfuckers song before I get out of here. Now, in the case of Big Pimpin', I had every intention on going and just putting up bars on bars on bars because of who I was working with. But he had intentions on doing a party record. Like, that was the thing. It was not like Renegades, where this is a beat and me and you finna rap against right. each other. This is like, oh, this is my party record. This ain't one of those records. This is my party record. Y'all niggas make good party music. Come get on this party record with me. I went and got on the party record, but I wasn't rapping about no party yeah, or no shit so like what? that. Like, <laughs> since I'm already here, and I know a bunch of motherfuckers that I don't know gonna be here, right. let, me, let me just do what I do. And that was the whole point of Pimp not even wanting to do the record because he didn't feel the record allowed him to do what he do. He did it. You know what I'm saying? That's why he only did eight bars because he was like, I don't want to rap on this shit, but I'm going to... But them the most memorable... I'm going to do eight bars, probably the most, the most memorable recited eight in bars in, in, in history, you know? Right. But that was the thing about a nigga like that. A nigga like that didn't need to say a lot to be impactful. Mm -hmm. Pimp was... Pimp could rap. Pimp could rap very well. Yeah, he could. But... Pimp never felt a need to Im import skills and all of that shit, which he could do all of that shit. And there's moments throughout, throughout, you know, the career where you'll see Pimp, you know, 
showed some dexterity. I it know it was mine. always there, but he just didn't want to get confused. Like sometimes I put a bunch of words in there and I put some big words. You might even know what the fuck it means. You might need to go read. Pisario, nigga. You know what I'm I mean, saying? So big southern rap pimp Pisario. What the fuck is a Pisario? Well, I mean, he's a, a person held in high regard that typically holds a high standing. He go one right here. System. <laughs> I mean, I know it was him, but I didn't know the definition. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. But, but him, he just didn't want to be misunderstood. That's why a lot of his rhymes are very slow and dragged out. They're intentional. I could rap fast on this record, but I don't need to rap fast on this record for you to know what the fuck I'm trying to say on this record. Mm-hmm. Me, I tried to put a word or a syllable everywhere they could fucking go. I wanted to rap over every, I wanted to touch every goddamn beat mm -hmm. in the motherfucking record. Um, and this is before we even had Pro Tools. I, we, you know, Ryan Dirty's the first album done, rap album done on Pro Tools. For real? We had beta version of Pro Tools. It wasn't even available for people. The studio we worked at was given the beta version of it to test it because he was like the number one radio commercial producer. He had a large sound bank in the country, and you know, Joe found him, and we was over there working, and they were like, yeah, this is gonna help us record everything faster, but I didn't want to punch in because I didn't want to say nothing in the studio that I couldn't say on stage. So punching in, to me, was kind of like a cheat, mm -hmm. you know? So I didn't use, I didn't punch in for years, and it was just really like, we just don't have time, man. Just fucking punch in kind of a thing. So you want to do the whole verse at one? Yeah, always. Always, because when I get on stage, I got to do it all in one. I ain't, I, like, Technically, there was no, there was, there was, there was a hype man at UGK for a small period of time, Bobo, the psycho Bobo Luciano. Bobo Luciano. Yeah, podcast, um, Super Tight TV um, was the hype man for UGK. Um, but that was, I mean, but it was more performative than anything. Like, we didn't really need nobody doing back and vocals and shit like that. Um, he just brought more energy. That's why he was a hype man, because he brought more energy to the show, because we were just niggas rapping, walking back and forth. He made the shit a little bit more entertaining. But... No, nah, man, I just I just always wanted to be able to out-rap all these niggas. I never needed to be the best rapper all the time. I just needed to be better than a nigga in front of me. Mm. So I, I, know tend to rise, I tend to song. rise against the competition. A Pimp C song I always wanted to hear a Bun B verse on. What? Or a song that I, I wish you would have been on. Uh, I Know You're Strapped. Yeah, but that was a personal song. To be fair, that was a personal. I know, but the, the, but that's that that shit was. You no, know, the beat is hard. There's a lot of fuck, look, man. man. There's songs that y'all will never hear that has some really flagrant flagrant shit on it. <laughs> very very flagrant shit on it. And and I always tell people, man, you know, if you got something on your chest, if you're an artist, man, go to the studio and say it, but you ain't got to put it out. Mm -hmm. Just get get that out your system, so you don't walk, be walking around feeling like that on a motherfucking day, because right. that shit could affect your judgment and how you handle shit in a moment. Um, and he had a lot of moments like that where he would just be at the house aggravated. And again, he's in Atlanta. I'm in Houston. So I don't hear a lot of shit till I go to the house. And then even then, mm -hmm. they're not trying to play that shit for me. Right. Cause I would be like, where the fuck did this came from? And then I'm start asking niggas, so you know this nigga made this? Right, y'all sitting around like... <laughs> and ain't nobody gonna say nothing. And ain't nobody said nothing. Can't nobody say shit. If y'all ain't tell me, that means y'all ain't tell him nothing. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, but whatever, like I say, I, I would just let... Let these things be what it was gonna be. And I'd be like, yeah, and I'd have to tell niggas, you know what would happen if this record come out right? You know what's gonna happen if the song would get out there. You know it's going from, from 10 to 1,000. Mm. That type of shit, you know? And he would take your guidance on that probably more than anybody else's. He'd take it into consideration. I mean, he, we he ain't never gonna, heard this shit. He was so gonna he took do it what he was gonna do, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times, you know, Pimp. I don't know if this is the right way to frame this, but Pimp was fucking with niggas a lot. <laughs> like, Pimp was fucking with niggas a lot, right? And really just like, Pimp would fuck with niggas because he could. I, I don't know no other way to say it. He would fuck with niggas because he could, and he really just was like, I'm going to go on stage tonight and diss this nigga, Right? And then he'll go on stage and diss the nigga. And I'll be like, man, what the fuck was this? Oh, Pee Wee, I'm just fucking around. Niggas ain't gonna do shit. <laughs> <laughs> How the fuck you know, nigga? I'm like, <laughs> they might, somebody might want it if they, if they standing next to the wrong niggas when they right. hear this shit. You never know. But I mean, to be fair, like, that, that wasn't really, that wasn't a concern for us for many, many years. That wasn't like, we weren't worried about niggas coming back and get, doing nothing for, for a long time. 
you know. So I just, you know, there's a lot of shit. I just was just, all right, well, and I knew niggas couldn't fuck with me, you know. Right. And we couldn't fuck with us. So it would just, these things would be said, and then, you know, it would kind of just live out there. But it wasn't social media. Right, right. Right? It so wasn't on social out, media. Yeah. So unless you was in Birmingham that night, or you was in Dallas yeah, that right. night, right? Yeah, when that nigga said that shit. Yeah, when that nigga said that shit. We, but we did go on a little tour, like, day for day talking shit, and that kind of got out, that. That that went a different way, but I mean, look, man, what you gonna do? The man, the man was a grown man. So you man. know, he felt how he felt. It is what They're it gonna, is. It was just gonna be what it was gonna be, and I didn't really, I never really felt threatened right. by, mm -hmm. by most people in that sense. Or maybe I was young and ignorant about shit, because anybody could obviously get killed, and so many people have died um, from this culture. But I don't know, man. We just. That's why I say I'm a much older, calmer nigga right now because right. I realize how much shit I actually really was in at right. certain parts of my life. Right. Like, even casually, like, people could have gotten killed. And, and, and everybody's not here, man. Everybody's not here. You know, some people die naturally. Some people die differently. And I just sit back and look at this shit, and I'm still going up. I don't. It's, I, I deal with a lot of survivor's remorse. You know, I deal with because a lot of people sold into a lot of people sold into who I eventually became, and they all and almost all of them are no longer here to see it. So I have to live in a way that these people were expecting me to live. I got to carry myself in a way that people were expecting me to carry myself because that was why they were supporting me. So when Pimp would always say I'm the best rapper, I got to go somewhere, sit down, and actually be that best rapper because he really believed that and he not finna stop saying it. Hell no. Nah. So if one day a nigga show up and be like, we got 100 racks on so-and-so, because this type of shit was happening, you know, DMX and, and, and you know, Rockefeller and, and Rough Riders and all these different niggas was battle rapping against each other and shit. And I don't know what I'm going to be in the room with one of these niggas. I'm going to rap one of these niggas under the table if I got to be type of thing because I don't want to let that nigga down. Yeah. But then I would go around and tell nigga Pimp had the best beats in the world. Couldn't nobody make no better beats than Pimp. And, and, and you couldn't talk shit. Like, we both would brag on each other. Uh, but then he lived up to everything that I said he was and more. And so I'm just really trying to live my life nowadays to be the best version of myself that they saw when all I saw was the worst version of myself in the moment. People sacrificed for me. And those people not here, man. And it's it's hard to enjoy it. I receive it, I acknowledge it, but it's like certain things I do and it feel bad because this person ain't here or they not here or she not here, you know what I'm saying? And this is what they wanted for me. A lot right. of these things that are happening for me now is because other people wanted it, other people fought for it, sacrificed, prayed for it, you know what I'm saying? Put their life on the line. I put my life on the line for French to see them, you know, get to where we were trying to go. My whole thing was never, UGK for me was never about money and music. I knew we were going to make good music, so we was going to make money. I had to get niggas home. That was my thing. I used to drive all the shows. I'd get up. I'd wake niggas up. I used to pack the suitcases because I got tired of the police on I-10 pulling us over and fucking our bags up because niggas just throwing shit in the suitcase. I started packing niggas' suitcase so when they opened it, they could see it was neat and folded. There ain't no dope in here. You know what I'm saying? We used to get pulled over literally every other weekend on I-10. After like 95, once the interstate got hot, it was, that was just a known thing that was going to happen. I knew I had the license. I knew I knew how to talk to police. So I would just drive. We'd get the show, go to sound check, get to the hotel, check niggas in, go do the show, come back. If it's cool in the city, we just could vibe out. I'd let niggas, hey, you know what I'm saying, some little work out there. If y'all want to holler at some hoes or whatever like that. If I knew it was a different vibe in the city, don't come out the room, shut the shit down. And in the morning, i wake niggas up, put niggas in the car, let's go. I was always the older one, the more responsible one in the group. And that was just the dynamic, man, because we had to get home. All that other shit never really mattered to me. I had people's husbands, people's sons, people's brothers. I've, I've had friends that have had to make that call. My road manager literally two New Year's ago had a heart attack on the road. I didn't want to have to call that man, mama, and tell him he didn't make it, no shit like that. I'm the boss. That's the job. It's my job to call these people because I'm the one that told their family they was going to be all right when they left with me. So I've always carried that kind of responsibility with me because ain't none of, the, ain't none of us out here doing it by themselves for the most part. You know, if, I could go out and rap by myself, but that ain't really fun. 
Right. You know, I don't need a hype man. I don't need nobody to pick up the money. I don't need nobody to do sound check. But fucking fun, fun is that? Right. You know, just out there by yourself. That's got to be miserable. I know a lot of niggas that don't want to be with nobody. You, I've been around you, my nigga. You ain't that cool to be around. You must can't stand your motherfucking self. Because <laughs> I can't stand you sometimes. Right. After about an hour, you spend all your time with just you. Couldn't be me, my nigga. Right. But I, I, I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed, man. I, I made it this far. I can still see success down the road, and there's a clear path. And, you know, I try to leave instructions. I take my wife everywhere to all the business meetings so she can know everything from top to bottom. I try to, you know, leave instructions and be like, you know, this is what this company need to do. And she got, she understand these things. And Because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, you know, y'all got to have, you got to have a will. You know what I'm saying? You got to have your will and testament. You got to have who this money's supposed to go to. You have to have all your shit lined up. All your affairs got to be all, all that shit because they be will take order. your money and give it to the motherfucking state. Yes, they would. They, they are dying to, for you, to take your shit when you die. They are hoping that somebody is so overwhelmed with emotion and grief after you pass that they don't do everything they're supposed to do and they, and they can take some shit. Everybody wonder like, damn, if our grandmother them had this house. What happened? What, what happened? We went. Ain't nobody to do the property. Nobody do the shit. Pay the property tax. Nobody did this. Nobody did that. You know what I'm saying? Crazy is that? That's crazy. And it's because that people, shit and people, but people be overcome with grief. You know what I'm saying? And people don't have. A, I, I don't understand men that live with women that they don't trust. I don't understand men that live with women that they hide money from. Why you got her? I might have got to know where everything at in case something happened to me. Because I can't get to it. Right. And I can't be on the phone trying to tell call you, and yeah. telling you <laughs> where shit is at. Hey, you got to go to Terry House. What well, fuck? Look, me and Terry, man, just go to Terry House. Tell Terry you need that from me. You know how hard it's going to be to get that shit from Terry? Oh, he ain't got nothing over there. I ain't getting nothing. What are you talking about? Bun mm. came in. That that shit. Two weeks talking Boy, about. Boy, I don't care. Bun, but Bun had it with the dimension. What are you talking about? I they said he, he was got about 2,500 over here, yeah. but that ain't going to really help. I think he was at the last stage of his dimension. I'm telling you, y'all. I gave him that three years ago. I done, seen it. I done yeah. seen it from the... From the street side of what happened when your shit ain't together and it go bad. I done seen it from the absolute 100% legal side. And shit, some of the most organized, having shit together people I've ever seen and known in my life. Smart, intelligent, sound people. And they, they but had no idea what it, what you have to do when somebody dies. Like, you got to prove you somebody's husband. Like, you can't just say, hey, my wife. Mm -hmm. You got to go get the, the license. You got to have pictures. You got to have all this shit. Mm -hmm. They just say it was a marriage of convenience and you wouldn't really. It's so much that goes into that type of shit. I didn't realize that until my sister-in-law died. And that's all I've been trying to do is make sure. Here's the other thing. Here's the crazy thing. This, and I don't, maybe more people know this. I, I didn't know this at all. So I'm doing my will. They say, well, who you want to give, give your money to? I said, I'm leave everything to my wife. Everything to my wife. Okay, and who else? What you mean? Ain't nobody else. <laughs> Ain't nobody else. Every, I died everything to my wife. What if she died before you? Fuck. You think about that? That was like two days. That was two days of reflection. Just the idea that my wife could die before me. You know what I'm saying? I hadn't even really, like, thought about that. Like, just as a, just as a concept. That fucked me up. And if that happened in the moment, I know I wouldn't have been prepared. So all that shit that you know is going to be hard and rough, to deal with and painful to talk about and all that shit. Do that shit while you got a sound mind and some free time. Because when folks die, you got to get through them children, you got to get through mamas and all of that. I don't mean to be getting into this because I know you grieving, but you understand what I'm saying. This is very real. This shit is so hard to try to fight through dealing with the emotion and grief and you're trying to keep a lot inside because the children, you, got, you know, you want to be there for the kids and if the kids see you cry, they gonna cry. And it's just, it becomes a circle. So you're trying to be strong and do all this for you. And your parents see you hurt. Your parents waiting for you. Somebody wait, come on. Now you can, I can't do it. I got I to gotta do this. I got to do that. And the, the more you try to make sure your house is together, the more you realize that the system is not, they, the system is Excuse counting me. on your fucking house move. to be a part. And they want their money still until you prove who you need. But I'm like, if I'm trying to prove to you and they calling for their money, they like, yeah, pay that until you can prove, prove them. Yeah. I'm like, what? So you paying penalties? So I can prove that you can't, cause you can't. It's a lot, man. And they ask these okay. people to do this in some of the darkest, deepest moments of their life, bro. I seen that shit happen, man. That shit's not cool. Yeah, I watch people I love go through it. 
And so I'm trying to be ahead of this shit. That way tell come, niggas. That's where it comes back when you say, previous in the interview earlier, financial literacy. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Everybody should have a will. I don't give a fuck. You nine. Keep writing in it until the Working end of class time. class people Keep more going. than anybody. Nine to five people more than anybody need a will and testament because they're the ones that are going to suffer most if they don't get the insurance money, if, they, if the house doesn't get... Those are the people that, you know, there's enough money that if something happens to me, we have shared accounts, so that kind of a thing. So it's not like I would have a separate account and she got to prove she's my wife to get that money or anything like that. But everybody's life is not set up like that. That's why I said I don't understand why you wouldn't... Why are you even sharing your life and your shit like that with somebody you really don't even fuck with? You know what I'm saying? You, ain't, you are not supposed to have a woman in your house you don't trust in your house. I know too many men that left for the weekend and came home and everything was gone. You know what I'm saying? Like, type of shit. And these things happen all the time. You have to be prepared for the worst. You don't sit around and think shit gonna go bad. You hope for the best. You plan for the worst. Right. And every time, like, something good happened to me. How you feel, B? Feel good. I'm all right. You know, I try not to get too high so that when bad things happen, I don't get too low. My son is like, my son Brandon is like this, the most even killed person I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen him get excited, and I've never seen him depressed. The man, about, about two months ago, my son was working, doing construction. He fell off a house, I think, I think they said about 12 feet, 12 or 13 feet, broke his leg in five places, broke both the tibia and the fibula in five places, on the ground screaming, you know, just trying to get, went to the hospital, gave him his dope, called us, I'm cool now. I'm good, nah. You know, most, and he's, you know, super um, athletic and you know, work out and all of that. Now he can't really do nothing. Most people like that get very depressed. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, y'all right over there? Yeah, shit, I'm watching football. I'm chilling, playing with the kids. I wish I could play a little more, but I'm down. I can't do much, but you know, I'm all right. Man, if I had, if I couldn't go nowhere and do nothing, mm -hmm. I, I'd be about, COVID, the only reason I survived COVID is because we had a backyard. We had a backyard that I could go outside and breathe and walk around and do shit like that. That being immobile, having to depend on somebody, that don't work for me. Mm -mm. Man, I that don't work for that. me. Mm -hmm. He's over there like a champ. He's like, yeah, I probably got about a year of rehab. So mm -hmm. Especially be, with them bones. I'm going to be down for a minute, oh, man. I'm going to be down for a minute. But I'm be, mm -hmm. you know. But he got hopes of knowing that, oh, I'm straight. Yeah, I mean, he's not, like I say, he doesn't get too down on himself. Man. Right? I'm having a bad day. You know, you look at your life. You think about your worst day, let's say. Let's say April 2nd is your worst day of the year. Hey, that's my birthday. Well, let's, oh, we gonna hope, let's say April 3rd. Then. There you go. I want you to have a good birthday. Yeah, I want you to have a good birthday. <laughs> I don't want you to do that. But let's say April 3rd is the worst day of, of your year. Right. right? Come when on, you look on, at though. the calendar, you zoom in on the calendar, and you see April 3rd, and you see this whole big, deep, dark crevice, right? Then you go out, you see the, the week April Wait. 3rd was on. And it's not that deep because the mother shit was not. Then you see the month mm -hmm. of April, right? Then you see that year. Mm -hmm. Then you see 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you see enough of your life that those deep, dark moments are just a little blip on the radar. So you can't get stuck in that moment in that sense about how bad shit is. You have to trust that, well, if this is bad, let this be as bad as it get. You got to keep going. You know what I'm saying? Let this be as bad as it get. And just let it get a little bit better every day. At least I can cling to that. You gotta find something to hold on to, man, to keep your sanity in this motherfucker. Well, you know, you old school driven. That's, that's, that comes from old school. The, but new, the I new know generation. Of, but I know a lot of old niggas is fucked up. They, they, most of the people in my generation did not embrace the next generation, which means they were less receptive to, to embrace technology. I'm one of the last niggas in my generation to get on it, but I understood the value in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had people helping me understand the value in it. Right. By the time a lot of my contemporaries tried it, there was nowhere for them to grow. It was no place and no space for them to really grow in it. You know what I'm saying? People get frustrated with this shit, and then they go sit down somewhere, go do some other shit, because right. they don't want to come outside not looking how they're supposed to look. Right. Yeah. The fuck that? What are you talking about, bro? Nah. Bring your ass on outside. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's... Bro, you what stay, you think, what you think nine year old you look like? What you think, 12 year old? You think 12 year old, you look better than what you look like? No, nigga, you, you, we all look crazy. 
And then we made something ourselves. Somebody came around, cleaned us up or whatever. You got enough money to start looking like you're supposed to look at whatever. You know what I'm saying? I, but I told my brother the other day, I said, bro, we are the new old niggas. We can't be acting like we them young niggas. When we graduated in 2010, this is our position. When we graduated in 2010, it was some niggas who graduated from high school in 96 talking about some, I'm still the new. No, you not. You graduated in 96. I just had to tell a nigga. A nigga I've, known for, I've known him for many years. And he, he recently got locked up and he came home. And, you know, he's, he's definitely not the man he was before. You could tell that his life has been hard and he's been through some things. And he come out, he's like, man, he's, I don't know how he got my number. I'm still looking for whoever gave him. Wink my number. Um, but he called me, he was like, man, you know what? Man, shit, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to get back right. You know, I'm fucking with this music. Now I'm like, what you mean you fucking with this music? Like, you know, I'm trying to do this music, man. I figured you could help me. Help you do what? You know, shit, hook me up with some DJs. I said, well, let me explain some shit to you. First of all, <clears throat> what do you think a DJ gonna do for you? Well, he gonna play my record in the club. When is he going to play your record? Tell me what songs he's supposed to play your record in the middle of that ain't nobody going to notice. What? Tell me the two big records that's jamming that's going to play in the club. So they're going to play Dreams and Nightmares and then your and shit. Then your shit. <laughs> right? That's what you're telling me. <laughs> DJ loses his motherfucking job doing that shit. Secondly, what make you think I'm going to use my relationship with a DJ to help you when I know you ain't jamming. You ain't heard my music. I ain't got to. I heard you rap before you went to jail. You wasn't good then. Yeah, I shouldn't have called this. <laughs> but but yeah, everything, I, everything, <laughs> but everything I said, because he too old for this shit. He too old for this the shit. Fuck so I you know exactly what he did. When he got off the phone with you, he called, <laughs> hey, check up. When he got off the phone, he called some more niggas. Yeah, you know, Bun, don't fuck with me. Yeah, yeah Bun, nigga don't change, man. Yeah, no, let me tell you something. Don't believe me. Them goddamn burgers and shit. Let, let, this nigga don't act like he know the fuck I ain't. Man, we wasn't cool before. Like Every nigga thing, in my right? town that know nigga. who I was cool with in school. Yeah, I, nigga, nigga, I do too. You they all know like, who my little was circle of nigga niggas right? was in school. Right. So oh, that nigga. Don't we, call, we don't be acting like me and you ain't walk. You, we ain't walk no hallways. Your locker wasn't by mine. We wasn't in homeroom. You ain't your fifty. Right. Oh, nah. I'm not. Cause and my thing is, I'm not finna lie to you. I'm too old to be on this phone talking about. Well, let me see what I can do. Let me hit you back. No, because you're going to be texting me. I don't want to answer the all that shit. Looking at my phone, time. getting mad. Fuck that. I got a burger. You know what I'm saying? I got. I need to answer real calls on my phone. So I yeah. can't be disregarding my phone if I think you finna call me and text. Fuck that. Look at my nigga. There's nothing I can do for you in this thing. I don't think there's anything you can do for yourself. Now, if, if you feel I'm wrong, by all means, go out and prove me wrong. I've had this conversation with my nephew. My nephew's like, Uncle, I want to rap. Okay. Prove it to him. Go ahead, go ahead, rap. You good? Go for it. No, I want, I want to rap with you. No, you can't rap with me. You can't rap with me, nephew. You're not, you're not that good yet. You're not that good. Yet. Who Fuck shit? This nigga, Look, man. Wait, wait, wait. So this is what my nephew man, my told. Uncle, this is what my man. nephew told me. My nephew say, "Did Granny <laughs> tell you the same thing?" I say, "Yep." And you know what I did? I moved out the next day. I moved out the next day, and I went and proved to her that I could make it when she said I couldn't. So there you go. Prove me wrong. There you go. Prove me wrong. Yeah, just go out there and do it. Shit, go out there and do it. Love you. Two but times you know a week. I always believe it. Two first, times a week. My first song gonna be a diss a to my uncle, nigga. First I, off, fuck my uncle, let nigga. Let it fuel Told me the shit. fire. Most <laughs> let it fuel the motherfucking fire. <laughs> Eminem mama, Eminem mama, fueled all the pain and hurt inside him to make all that music. And I bet ain't no, no nigga you know living good as Eminem mama. Even if he don't give a, a hundredth of what he got, she's straight. But we're, not finna go, we're not finna do all of this. We're not, let me tell you something. I'm very good at no. I'm very good at no. I got to learn that. I'm very good at no. We're not finna do this, especially in your face. Please don't ask me something in mixed company. Please don't ask me something in mixed company. Mm. Cause then you go on to fight and all that type of shit. Cause I'm gonna tell you, you, you really want to have this conversation? Yeah, I was gonna sing some music. I'm gonna just yeah, this nigga, <laughs> this hey, nigga, man. this nigga's my mom. And I'm not saying I'm right. <laughs> that's not saying. That's 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 I'm that not saying I'm right on the podcast. That's a few. That's a few that people understand. Like like you said earlier, everybody don't know how to take criticism. No, everybody because I I felt like how pimp did. I don't I don't feel like I don't lie to a lot of people. 
And I'm not saying that I done lied to you. And who am I to tell you you good or bad? Down my opinion, but you came and asked me. Should I tell you the truth or should I just give you some motivation? Most people ask you that for you to tell them what they, they want. They want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. The whole point of asking you is this. I told them what they want to hear. This is how they ask you. Yeah. They, this is what they say. They don't ask you what you think. They say, that shit jamming, right? Right? You like, they, right like, it's, like it's infectious or some shit. Like if I smile hard enough, this nigga gonna smile too. Yeah, if no. I like it hard enough, he gonna like it too. That shit jamming her. Oh, yeah, that shit jamming her. That shit jamming her, G. I thought Not really, my nigga, but there's, room, but there's room for improvement. There's some room for improvement, but that's uh -huh. not, no, not right now, no. Oh, you a realist. Man, we got the hip hop historian yeah, in here, man. man. My boy, Come Newface, on. you know he got some. Don't you saw him some shit, he gonna tell you. That ain't I, right. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what he could possibly have new, because I feel like I done signed most of everything this nigga's had uh -uh. over the years. I've known New Face for several years God now. God damn it, And new I feel face. like every time I've ever seen him, he done brought me something to sign. And I feel like I done signed the catalog, so I don't know what's left. No, it's new face. We done done the magazines and all this shit. New I don't face know what's left. Is, uh, new face this nigga's a lunatic. Nigga, this nigga is from the outside the ice wall. So, so what I had to do, I wanted to say for this platform, um, I put on social media, um, when Rock the Bells announced that they were ever going to be the first ever hip hop cruise, I put my logo, New Stars, and Rock the Bells logo with this cruise. And I uh, reached out to my Instagram supporters and said, Can you tag Rock the Bells and show love? Because I want to be on this boat. And everybody showed love. But I got this one DM from this brother right here. He said, um, Give me your number. I'm going to make a call tomorrow. Suffice to say, I made it on that Rock the Bells cruise. My collection was uh, displayed on the seventh floor. See? So I wanted to say personally thank you for that that DM, my brother. That's very easy, man. You do a lot. You do a lot to show people love and give people their flowers. You extend yourself on your dime, travel around this country. You know what I'm saying? To support. Even before you were knowing these people as contemporaries and friends, you were traveling around the country on your dime as a working man, parent, and all of this shit. Right, single dad? See, you know what I'm saying? All of this type of shit, but still finding the time to get out there, support people, go to their concerts, keep the tickets, take pictures, get posters, all this type of shit, believing that there was going to be inherent value in all this shit at a certain point. Everybody was going to feel about these people like you felt about these people. Right. And look now, everybody does, and you are the premier historian of the culture. There's no reason that, that you shouldn't have been on that boat. And uh, LL, he did a book sign. Uh, LL presents the streets win. Uh, 50 years of hip hop creatism, right there in this book, right there. They featured yourself. Oh, wow. I'll show you that. And again, so this was just put out. So this okay, so that's something new to sign. Something new. Dang, dang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he did it. That nigga new face. Boy, goddamn boy. I got, you. That I got the first Bum B Trill Burger when you came to Atlanta. I thought you were about to pull that bitch out of your pocket, nigga. Man, if you would have pulled a Trill Burger out of your pocket, that would have been hard. But man, we, you see, he said it right there. Look, we, got, uh, we got the stuff. He was already signed. Then he got the catalog. He got the catalog. Solo album. He talked about that with difficult to make. Without his brother right there. But this is all. My new thing. New face is here. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Goodness. Present tense. We got to start referring to you in the present right tense. There. Oh, like you said, it's already signed. Yeah. And these are not all in one sitting. Oh, I That's know. That's the other thing. Yeah. There's the other thing. These are different moments, you know what I'm saying? Catch me in different places with different shit. You. That's a nigga that gave the dude your number that called you to jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You said, <laughs> you said, <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy. I know the brother. I would love to help the brother. Right. But I, whatever he thinks it is that I can do for him, I can't really do nah, for him. Nah, for nah. several reasons. Nah, nah. You know, for several reasons. I wish him the best. And I, I would hope that people succeed in spite of me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like anybody that I didn't think could make it. And it's probably been one or two for sure. But I hope you make it in spite of me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Blow up and shit on me. But <laughs> I'm doing shit. You know what I'm saying? I shit back though. Yeah. Shit, I do I do shit back though. Right. Just hey, when you was doing the, uh, what was the cannonball, gumball? Gumball. Gumball. What was your vehicle of choice? Typically, an Escalade, if I can get them. They're very hard to get in Europe. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, But it got a lot of room, because I typically go four people. One of the people is like six foot five, six foot six, or some shit like that. And I need a car with a lot of room. And trunk space is valuable, because you're typically gone for 10 days. 
You know what I'm saying? You fly in, you got to get your car situated, you drive for six days, and then you got two days of partying on the back end of it. So I, I need a car with a lot of rooms. So I can bring a lot of luggage. Now, I, there's some people that be in Ferraris and Lamborghinis and ain't got no luggage space in that, but these are very rich people, so they'll have... Another car? They'll have, well, sometimes they have another car. They'll have a support car, right? So they just carry their clothes and take pictures and shoot video of them. Or sometimes they'll, I know people that have shipped different clothes to different cities and they just leave what they want and just get to the hotel and it'd be clothes for that night and the clothes for the next day and they leave whatever they had and just keep going. But I've seen people spend some obscene amounts of money without trying to be like, not like capping on just, they rich and it's just very convenient Man. to do things a certain way. That's always been something I want to do. I like that's my meditation. That's my leisure. I drive around, man. At the shows, 90 percent. I say that at this point, <laughs> 97 percent of the time, that's what I'm doing, just because you know it clears my mind and it's you know just time for me to be able to gather my thoughts. But the gumball, just being able to ride around like that, is something I always wanted. I'm not even in the cars, but just the actual. It's intense, acting. though. It's intense because it looked like it's fun, but it's. It's it's it is fun, but it's a lot. So like, let's say it's a challenge. <clears throat> it was, you know, the, the first day of driving is on Sunday, so we'll get in about Thursday or Friday. We'll drink and we'll party and party. And you get up Sunday by noon, we'll get in your car. You're gonna drive about six, seven hours. We're gonna get to the city. <clears throat> gonna check in. We're gonna go to dinner. We're gonna go to the club party till about three, four in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning, we're gonna get back in the car. We're gonna drive about six hours. Go to lunch. Anywhere from four to six hours, depending on how fast you drive. Go to lunch. You're going to drive another four to six hours. Check in. Go to dinner. Go to club. Party. Four in the morning. Get back up. Get in the car. Nine o'clock in the morning. That's I intense. You know no, it ain't. Not and, me. And the, more, uh, the further you go, the longer the drive. The I'd the be long, I, I've driven. I did, I did Atlanta to... We did Atlanta to New York. One day. That was the second day. First day was Miami to Atlanta. Second day was Atlanta to New York. Oh, yeah, I can do that. As like, long as I ain't got to go to the party. And if they require you to go to the party, I might be in We trouble. left Atlanta at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I told you, nigga, we finna do the fastest, serious, most serious driving you ever done in your life just to get to that bitch by midnight. Like, you got to do the best driving you ever done in your life. You still got to not get pulled just over. Just to get to that hoe by so midnight. How, so how did the crew come about? Like, how did y'all meet? How did they, like, all right, this will be us? This UGK? It's us. Like you said, can't nobody come in after this is. No, UGK was with several people. Um, UGK was a group before me. Chad and this dude named Mitchell Queen were the original uh, iteration of UGK. And then me and two other dudes came in, and then we became a four-man group. And then the other two dudes decided to go play football and do other stuff. And we was left uh, as a two-man group, but the, we still had the four-man group name. And so when we brought the demo to Big Time Records in the flea market in Houston, and we brought him tell me something good. And he was like, I love this record. I think this is a good record. What's the name of the group? And we had no other name, so went back UGK. to UGK. Man, that's love, man. What's your favorite old school? Car? Yeah. It's a good question. I had an 83 Park, 84 Park Avenue that my stepdaddy gave me. That was a good, dependable car. But I always wanted a deuce in a quarter. Ooh. But just because it was called the Deuce of the Quarter. Right. But you know, I come up in the era where I come up in the era with the Toyota trucks. You like the fucking Toyota trucks? No, no, nigga. from the era where they were slab trucks. I don't know how they did everybody. Oh, I know yeah. Texas. Corey, that's why Corey laughed. Corey remember that era. No Corey, was little, Corey was a little, little bitty boy back then. You but that when they, that's when black God. people could typically, the only people that drop cars like that now are typically Latinos or Asians. Right. But that when black people, you know, was dropping the Toyota. Not no big old Toyota either. Just, just, little, just a trucks. little bitty mini truck, man. We used to have the Yoda. Four. In Port Arthur, we used to have this crew called the Yoda Posse. And they had four Toyotas. And they would drive through the hood and they'd get to the little intersection of your corner. Like, I lived off uh, Fifth Avenue and 15th Street. Stephen Jackson had played basketball and all that. Mm -hmm. He lived on, he lived on between 4th and 5th. I lived between 5th and 6th. Um, and then they would come through and they'd get to that little stop sign and then they'd all turn. That would have turned and go. And that's when they used to have them. Niggas would make speaker boxes and wood. wood uh, For the whole bed. Yeah, no but they would make them off. at school, though. Yeah. They used to have a wood shop wow. class. And niggas, once niggas figured that type of shit out, figured that shit, but that was a whole hustle in itself. You had high school niggas making speaker boxes for grown people back then. Right. Yeah. We used to take, man, I remember I used to take my mama, like, home stereo system, right, out of the house, put them in my homeboy car, 
connected, connected through the apps, you know what I'm saying, through the wires, because everything used to have them wires that would go in the back yeah. and be playing my mama's speakers in the car because he ain't had those big men. I'm talking about, hey, man, them was House the speakers, that was them. House speakers was lit. Yeah. I had some house speakers in my car. Um, I asked Big Daddy Kane this on this platform. Um, you remember how significant uh, we are in the same game self-destruction was for our era. And with the current state of violence and things going on, if we were to put a self-destruction, you know, 2024 together, who would like four MCs that you think would be vital for that type of movement in this generation? Well, I mean, in order to, for it to really connect, these things to connect, you would have to have people that the young people of this generation would respect in that space. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think a Killer Mike would be a, a great person to have, but I also think a Meek Mill would be a great person to have. I think Freeway would be a great person to have. And um, we would honestly need like another little baby moment. You know what I'm saying? Because you need these younger artists that these these kids can re, you know look up and respect and see themselves in. You know what I'm saying? Young people have to feel like you understand them, right? You're willing to meet them where they are. That don't mean be childish. That means understand their culture, understand their frames of reference, understand why kids are wearing hoodies in the summer type of shit. You know what I'm saying? It's got no, nothing to do. Hood off. You know? You have to learn how to heat strokes. But again, I think, I think, I think, I don't know if it really works because we actually live in an environment right now, musically, and this, again, I'm not here to judge nobody, but we have, more people that are active than are inactive. That's never really been the dynamic in the culture. You'd have a handful of people that were still in the life, but you know, like Benny, C, uh, Benny the Butcher got one foot in and one foot out kind of a thing. But we have people now who are, you know, very prominent artists in the culture who are active outside. You know what I'm saying? Them and they circle, they really still in the element presently, you know, for whatever reason, they still in the element. So I think it's very hard for people who are literally living a life that requires them to actively dodge violence from, from people mm -hmm. to start saying stop the violence because that's just not the world perspective that they have. Wow. And again, everybody everybody ain't there. We, we would love for everybody to be positive and focused and give these good messages, but everybody ain't there. You'd ask 19-year-old me, wet me? Man... Fuck what I don't know, nigga. Move around. I ain't trying to hear that shit. Right? And I knew, and I know more, and I knew more than most niggas my age. But I wasn't trying to speak on no shit like that. I wasn't trying to be active on no shit like that. Then you start having kids, and you realize how long life really is, and you know, just people that's gonna be living in this world when you gone. And you start really thinking about, well, am I gonna leave this hole better than I found it, or did I just take, take, take? You know what I'm saying? So I've lived long enough for the perspective to change. For me, you know what I'm saying? We just gotta let young niggas that's active figure it out how this gonna go for them. You know, ain't nobody gonna stop doing what they wanna do till they ready. Right. You know what I'm saying? And some people, you know, I know a lot of niggas that sold dope, got away for, for a long time, and hustled one day too long. Gotta do it. That's it, you hustle one day too long. I gotta ask before you leave, man, he said something about murder, that verse. Was you and Pimp in the studio together? Did y'all record that together, or was it yeah. more? Y'all was in it, like, was it? What was that like when you seen him rapping? Like, cause that was the first time, me personally, that I had ever heard somebody rap to where it, it's three Pimp C verses that, that for me is murder, a kick dough, and uh, kick dough. oh, a kick dough is my shit. And then the one where you talk about, you know, how versatile he was when, you know, gripping grain, switching lanes, selling cocaine out of candy thing. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Lil Wayne got a trunk of bank because yeah. I'm a hot boy. Like I'm them. Playing. Mm -hmm. Them three verses are the verses that, to me, if I had to, you know, define Pimp to somebody who never heard him before, those would be the three I would play. But Murder, I think, is the most profound one. So, like, when y'all recorded that, was that, were y'all in that space? Like, were both of y'all in that space to be able to put something down? Because both of y'all verses are ridiculous. On I would love to sit here and tell you a very deep, profound story. I mean, I want to hear a real the story. The of Murder. The reality was, I've only really been, like, drunk about five days in my life, because I have a really high tolerance. That was probably day number two in my life, mm -hmm. where I'd actually been really drunk the night before, and uh -huh. I came in, I was fucked up. Now, Skip Holman, the studio where we used to work at. Corey, you, did you ever come over, Skip? All right, so again, this is the guy that had Pro Tools in the beta version. He had the, probably the most 
digitally advanced boards you could have. You had an SSL board, it had at least 100 and something tracks, right? Beautiful setup, raised off the ground, whatever. So I came in and I went to sleep. I came in, I went to sleep. Like they was laying the track out in production wise. And I, I guess he laid his vocals. I don't know if I was, I can't remember if I was awake or not, but I know I was sleep under the board. I was fucked up. I came in, I just went to sleep because that was the coldest place. Cause these big equipment have to have fans to keep them cool. Mm -hmm. So where the board at is typically where it's cool. So I went laid up under that hole and laid it down, right? And so they woke me up and they say, B, it's your time, you know what I'm saying, to rap. And so I, I got up. I guess I had written a rhyme before. I, I, again, I'm getting old. I imagine I wrote the rhyme before because I know I didn't wake up and write it. I woke up and, and went in and I spit it. And what you hear is take two. So I had done take one. And they asked me, did I want to punch in? I was like, no, nah, I'm going to just do it again. Take me back to the top. And so the murder that you hear is take two. I have no idea, no recollection of what Pimp was doing when he wrote his verse. I don't believe I was awake when he laid his verse. I was That's barely crazy. awake. I was of barely all awake. Verses, this but, nigga was asleep. But here's, what, but here's <laughs> the thing. Sleep. Here's the thing. Murder was not even about Pimp. The whole point of murder was me bitching constantly, man. You keep saying I'm the best rapper in the world. I can't show niggas I'm cold at 73 BPM, bro. I need, I need some 85, some 88. I need some fast tempo music. And so murder was the one. Murder was the one that was finally fast enough for me to really well, rap like I wanted to. I'm the to. king of moving chickens. Got but the it thing, also nigga. required him. <laughs> it also required him to rap fast, too. Yeah. And, and come like that on the song. Um, I had no idea, really, that it was just a rhyme at the time. I did not write this rhyme and lay it and be like, the game has changed. What? I went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to sleep. And it, just eventually, <laughs> and it just eventually became what it was because nobody was really from where we were and what we represented. When I say we, I mean the South. What? You had niggas that could spit from the South, but it was never really the objective to get caught up in that. It was really about making sure niggas understood what you were saying, because some of us had very deep and heavy accents and trying not to get their they neighborhood and what they represent fucked up. We were already good on that. So I had been asking a nigga for a rhyme where I could really rap. This was the one. I went now, I felt like I did my thing, and then that was it. And it wasn't until really, because I didn't know if niggas that didn't rap would even appreciate it. And it ended up becoming, for one, like, it was almost like a bat signal to niggas in the South. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You, ain't gotta, you ain't gotta spend your time being Southern, proving you Southern. We Southern. Ain't no way around it. Prove to them niggas you can do anything them niggas do. Not full time, you don't have to. But if I wanted to, I could do anything you doing. Very few people can, do, can say the same for about how we move. There's a few people who can, who are very comfortable doing more southern bass type music, just as, or just as comfortable as they are doing things that are more to their reach. But it's not for everybody. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of people. With, but now, in hip hop now, you almost have to incorporate certain aspects of southern lifestyle and culture to even, for it to even resonate. See, we woke up one day and realized that if it's a numbers game, we win. Hell yeah. If this is all about numbers, we got the most people. West Coast is California. Las Vegas, Seattle, you know what I'm saying? Oregon, maybe, I guess, some of that shit, right? That's technically, as far as we look on the West Coast, right. as far as hip-hop. Right. The East Coast is New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Philadelphia. They can't even claim D.C., uh, you know what I'm saying? Right. The South. How many of these motherfuckers you want? Texas, Texas, baby. Louisiana, Oklahoma, that alone. Mississippi, Alabama, yeah. Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? We ain't even, we, uh, Kentucky. Kentucky. We ain't even got to these, we ain't even got to these, <laughs> maybe it's like a Missouri, yeah. right? Y'all ain't East Coast, y'all yeah. show more yeah. like us, you yeah. know. We, we, the Midwest we, Coast we, is we South. Kentucky. And they identify. We the Midwest Kentucky. identifies with the yeah. South because they're nothing like the East Coast and nothing like the West Coast. Uh -huh. So just based on identity and principles, that's why Washington, D.C. gravitates to the South because you're nothing like the East Coast. Uh -huh. You don't have to move that fast. You don't have to talk that fast. So when Texas niggas and Louisiana and South niggas come up, it make all the sense in the world. It's very easy for us to communicate to each other. Even if it is different slang. You know what I'm saying? 
we yeah, get yeah. each other. We kind of move the same way. Talk, talk. I always laugh when you say you hit a bitch in the face with a pie out of mold. Yeah. <laughs> the way slap, that nigga just looked bitch. at you and nodded. Yeah, that's that's a fact. So that's, that's so <laughs> there's a very famous movie scene between Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, and I think he puts like a a cake or something. In mm -hmm. But I remember that I'd never seen a man do that to a woman. Like, they was arguing about something, and he clapped in the face with a cake. I was like, that's pretty hard. I would, I would love to just. You know, I would love to put a, I would love, I would, I would love to just put a, a if I'm mad, like, because I don't want to fight you, yeah. right? Uh, right. But I feel, I feel like putting the cake in your face is just disrespectful enough to not, con but it, without constituting abuse. Yeah. Right. Ladies, is it, I, would you call the police if your man put a cake in your face? <laughs> Do you, would you consider that hands on you? What would you say? You say? Like, if y'all in the middle of a real bad guy, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> You'll be bad if you're gonna call the police. Get, you can't get mad on the police, right? Well, depending on how delicious you are. Now, I'm not telling you, niggas. <laughs> what type I'm of not cake telling was? nobody <laughs> here to put no pie, no pie, or no cake what in no bar face. Because I don't know what kind of woman you got. Right. So I wouldn't recommend it. I'm just trying to read the room. Right. You know, the faces of the room and the women, they didn't really seem pleased by that. So if y'all happen to date a woman that worked behind the scenes up here, they ain't about that cake shit. Especially Especially about it. They, ain't taking, yeah. they ain't taking no cake shit off. They ain't had the type. When he wrote that rhyme, they wasn't wearing the type of eyelashes the ladies are wearing now. That'd right. be very detrimental. <laughs> take that cake off your eyelashes, come with it. <laughs> take your cake off your face. A lot, of, with, yeah. a lot of new things with these new women. There's a lot of new things. And new men. It's a lot different. It's a lot different right now. I'm, glad, I'm glad, glad I don't have to come navigate that type of shit. No. I hear that. Find a spot on here to sign on the yeah, table, man. I don't want to okay, sign that nigga sign that. Got got open space right here. I'm going to get low, because that's what's wrong. Some of these niggas, these niggas, y'all be having some middle-aged niggas in there. They can't get low. <laughs> well, look, man. We got you We got you some 85 South Show shit, too. Facts. And I meant to hit y'all for hand size. I'm going to have to send y'all some Trillberg shit. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I got new errors now. Oh, you know what right. I'm Got to come to the store to get it. Come on, y'all. We're going to put some online merch out there, but it's best to... You know, make niggas come in. I want them to come in and get the experience. I've been mean, so first time. I've been through the trap for the Let it be the last. Let it be the last. So we got to figure out how to do it. I'm going to have to figure out how to Bun do it. We out of here. You we need. set that up. Huh? We need to have some a trail burger. Alley.